And you can join us along the way. And um, Monte also will be joining soon. Okay, not a problem. Um, I'll start the webinar right now. Mm. The new presentation and the welcomes. Is that okay? Yes, please. Okay, I'm admitting them in. Let's just give them another second. There's a couple joining us. It's quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can begin. All right. Thank you, Simpiwe. So thank you, everybody, for, for joining us from wherever you are joining from. Good morning. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lengi Wedube. I'm from the Center for Human Rights here at the University of Pretoria. I work as the uh, project manager for the Center's Expression, Information, and Digital Rights Unit. And our work is on aspects of freedom of expression, access to information. We also tackle issues around the intersection between technology and, and human rights. But today's conversation is focusing on access to information within the context of, um, of elections in, in Africa. And um, our conversation is centered on the assessments that we uh, conducted as uh, the Center for Human Rights together with our partners um, at Article 19, where we were assessing state compliance with the guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa, which is a, a standard setting document that was adopted by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in 2017 uh, with the realization that access to information plays a very critical role in a democracy and specifically in the context of, of elections. So now based on those guidelines, we decided to do an assessment of how the state parties to the African Charter are faring as far as access to information is concerned during their elections. So our initial assessment was based on the South African elections in 2019, and we then moved on to other countries. And we've done that in Kenya, in, in the Gambia, in Ghana, um, and also in Uganda. And we are currently uh, working on the, on the Zimbabwean elections that you know were very, um, there was, there's a lot of that happened during the Zimbabwean elections that is relevant to this conversation. So for the purposes of today's um, uh, event, we are going to have the uh, keynote address by the current Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information um, on the continent in Africa. And we are also going to have brief remarks from um, Article 19 and also Eastern Africa and Western Africa. And we are also um, going to have um, the representatives, um, not representatives, but the researchers that compiled the different reports that will be launched uh, today. Um, Jay Gunn, Gray Johnson, we have Lawrence Mute, um, we have uh, Daniel Rueza, and we also have Michael um, Nyarko, who are going to give us this brief um, remarks or the main findings and main recommendations of the assessments that they conducted in the different countries. We are also then going to briefly reflect on um, the developments that we see across the continent um, on elections um, uh, in Africa. And then we are also going to also reflect on the Zimbabwean elections. And um, we are also throughout the different stages of our, our program going to have a moment of reflection and uh, commenting and also asking questions that will be responded to by our relevant um, speakers. 
So I'm going to quickly now hand over to Lloyd Kuvea, the Assistant Director of the Center for Human Rights, to give us brief um, welcoming remarks on behalf of the center. Thank you. Uh, a very good morning to everyone. Um, thank you so much, Tlengiwe. Uh, and um, thank you so much to all the participants that are attending this webinar. Um, we are expecting more than 100 or close to 200 participants uh, to join the webinar. Um, I think this signifies the importance of uh, elections in Africa and why uh, proactive disclosure is being taken seriously by everybody uh, to ensure that we have uh, more transparent elections on our continent. Um, so just welcome to everyone. And I want to thank, first of all, uh, Leng Yue uh, as the manager of the unit that is running this project, very excited. Uh, we really wish that uh, we can actually cover many more countries uh, than the ones we have covered so far, because it is absolutely critical to do that. I think elections in Africa, we have faced a lot of challenges, especially around the issue of uh, transparency of the elections, the freeness and fairness thereof. Um, and um, we have had a, lot, a number of electoral disputes around uh, that very issue of failure by the electoral management bodies and um, the incumbent governments uh, in terms of uh, just ensuring that there's, there's openness, there's transparency, and people are able to access information without having to make requests or without having to go through the administrative hurdles of acquiring information, including some of the most basic and important documents like the uh, voters role itself. So this is very important. Um, I would also want to thank, I mean, of course, uh, besides uh, playing you a team of, with Mary Stella Ompa, I think Jared has also played a, a role in terms of uh, the um, the reports that are that are coming out. Uh, Michael Nyako has also played a role, but I also want to thank uh, especially uh, our researchers who are really experts in the area. I'm seeing very familiar faces. My good friend Jagan, who did the report in Gambia, um, Michael Adani, um, Daniel, uh, of course Commissioner Mute. Uh, we're really looking forward to, you know, uh, your findings, the presentation of your findings. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that uh, these reports are going to really help us in terms of not just the discussion, which is important, but also more importantly, in um, getting other states, you know, to similarly try and um, uh, ensure that their elections are in accordance with uh, the guidelines on access to information in, in, in Africa. Um, somebody was saying, okay, are you going to do something about uh, Swaziland? And another person interjected and said, but ele elections in Swaziland are not really elections, they are selections. <laughs> so uh, we know that elections in Swaziland are happening on the, I think uh, they are finalizing the elections on the 29th uh, of, uh, of uh, this month. So it's going to be interesting to see the outcome, outcome thereof. I'm also keenly looking forward to a, a sneak preview into the Zimbabwe elections that have just uh, happened uh, by Admire. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, but also now, just want to say thank you to Commissioner, uh, Honorable Commissioner Topsy Sono for really taking the time to join us. Thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you um, and supporting uh, a lot of our projects. Uh, in your capacity as the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and access to information uh, in Africa. Thank you so much. I also just want to thank um, our partners, um, Article 19 in Western and, and in West and East Africa uh, for you know partnering with us on this, I think, highly successful project. Uh, thank you so much for the partnership as well as to the commission uh, in general. Uh, that we have worked with and have supported this project as well. Thank you very much. Um, what remains for me now is simply to wish everybody uh, a rich 
uh, deliberations as we listen to the findings of the researchers uh, and also generally what Maxwell is going to talk about in terms of uh, you know the situation of elections on the continent. One of the things, and we were discussing this with Flengue, one of the things I think we would also want to see happening is covering Francophone Africa. I mean, I think we know what has been happening in that part of the continent, and I think it's going to be absolutely critical for us to also go there and, and analyze um, what is happening in terms of the elections in, in Francophone Africa. We know we, we've been following all these coups that are happening there, and, and I think the opaqueness of some of the elections that side is, is really worrying. So I'm hoping that we can move into that region as well and cover that. So without wasting any further time, I also want to thank our funders. Um, we have been, uh, we've come through um, in, in supporting these projects. And of course, um, I know Jagan is here, OSF. Thank you very much um, for all the support that you've always given to the center. Yes, so I'll, now without wasting further time, I'll hand over to uh, Lengue so that we continue with the project, with the program for the for, for the day. Thank you so much. Over to you, moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd, uh, for those brief remarks on behalf of the center. Now we call upon our, our partner from Article 19, Eastern Africa, Patrick, to give us a brief remarks on behalf of his organization. Patrick, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so on behalf of Article 19 South mm -hmm. Africa, we are also very pleased to have been part of this partnership with the Center for Human Rights and Policy, uh, the Center for Human Rights in Pretoria. Um, Article 19 works uh, to protect and uh, to defend the right to freedom of expression. So access to information is, is very much part of uh, our mandate. And um, we supported the Kenyan case study um, that was uh, drafted by Commissioner Mute. Um, as everyone knows, um, the commissioner also has, um, during his time at the African Commission, was very instrumental in pushing for the access to information um, at, at the continental level. Uh, so um, as Article 19, we had a broader project that looked at elections in Kenya. And this one, um, so this was just a contribution to that broader project. Uh, part of the uh, other themes that we did was on capacity building of uh, over a thousand journalists. We worked um, so that they could um, use the access to information uh, provisions within our laws uh, to get proactive information from the independent uh, boundaries uh, commission. We also had an MOU with the uh, with the election body, and this one helped us then to uh, to really know which are the avenues to ask for information. We worked together with the journalists, with the online communicators, uh, for them uh, to seek uh, uh, information beforehand from the uh, Independent and Boundaries Electoral Commission. And as a lot of this is that um, uh, we, I think in a, in a long time, we had a very, uh, quite an election that access to information was not part of the barriers that, uh, that we, uh, we had, like we had previ previously encountered. And we credit this to part of the contributions that we did uh, together with the election body and also the support we got uh, from the government uh, institutions in, in that regard. So as Article 19, these guidelines really would help us even to uh, further see how do we strengthen our provisions on access to information, knowing that it's still a long journey that we have. Uh, so the elections is just one part of uh, a small segment of the governance process. And we hope that the report then would uh, help us to strengthen our engagements uh, on access to information, uh, not only on elections, uh, but but even broader uh, in the broader sense. Um, so definitely would want also to thank uh, the researchers um, and especially Commissioner Mute, whom we worked very closely with during uh, this process, uh, the Center for Human Rights in Pretoria. Thank you very much also for the collaborations that we did. Um, and also to acknowledge that um, uh, we got the funding uh, from the Loyal Netherlands Embassy in Kenya, and that one really helped then also to uh, at least to cover some of the costs that went to the production of, of this report. Um, and also to acknowledge uh, the support that we got from the uh, other colleagues in the call from the Article 19 East African office. Um, so mine is also to wish uh, everyone good, de good deliberations and also to thank Commissioner um, uh, for joining uh, this webinar and, and looking forward to her comments. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, um, Patrick. Uh, we really value um, the partnership that we had uh, throughout the, the process. And um, this work would not have been possible without all the support that we, we received, uh, not only from Article 19 Eastern Africa and West Africa, but also the, the, the funding partners and everybody else who, who was involved. So now we move on to our keynote um, address, which we are going to receive from our uh, current special rapporteur on, on freedom of expression um, and access to information um, in Africa. Those of you that are not aware, this special mechanism was introduced to the African Commission in 2004. Actually, in 2024, next year, this mechanism is going to be uh, 20 years old, and I suppose there's a lot uh, to reflect on when we are looking at access to information and freedom of expression on the, on the continent over the time that the mandate has been in existence, and the access to information aspect of it was introduced um, in 2007, and the commission has been doing a lot of work around these two, two thematic uh, focus areas on the continent. So um, I'll hand over to you, um, the Commissioner Topsisonu, to take us through the, the keynote address. Over to you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Jube. So good morning, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be present virtually at this very important event. First and foremost, I would like to convey my congratulations to the Center for Human Rights for convening this webinar, during which we will launch reports on proactive disclosure of information and elections in specific state parties in Africa. Given that these reports are the latest in a series regarding elections in Africa, I would like to commend the Center for Human Rights for its continued commitment to monitor elections in Africa from the perspective of fundamental right of access to information. The information environment along elections time is an underexplored area. It is for this reason that the African Commission on Human and People's Rights undertook through its resolution on the development of guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa, adopted during its 18th extraordinary session in 2015, to address the absence of a regional standard on the role of access to information in the electoral process as a means of guaranteeing the credibility of elections in member states and the overall strengthening of democratic governance in Africa. Following a consultative process, the African Commission adopted the guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa, noting that they're being proactive, in providing information on the electoral process is not only imperative, but also a tool for fostering accountability and transparency of key election stakeholders and for guaranteeing the credibility and integrity of electoral process. During this webinar, studies of the recent elections in Ghana 2020, Kenya 2021, Uganda 2021, and the Gambia 2022 will be the focus of our discussions. I welcome the, this opportunity to discuss the successes and challenges in addition to the lessons learned during the conduct of elections in these four state parties. Ladies and gentlemen, one particular aspect I would like to highlight is the issue of elections during the digital era. The reality is that digital content consumption has increased significantly and more people are turning to the internet to search for information, not least during the election period. It is for this reason that in the Joint Declaration on Freedom of Expression and Elections in the Digital Age, adopted in 2020 by the four international and regional mandate holders on freedom of expression, we noted that, and I quote, the positive potential of digital technologies during elections including to give voters access to information and to empower them to express their opinions and interact directly with candidates, and to give candidates and parties, including those with limited resources, the ability to disseminate their messages and mobilize support." Unquote. Furthermore, the Joint Declaration on Freedom of Expression and Internet, adopted in 2011, stresses the transformative nature of the internet in terms of giving voice to billions of people around the world 
of significantly enhancing the ability to access information and of enhancing pluralism and reporting. In this regard, I note the challenges related to the use of technology during elections, highlighted in the reports which are being launched today. As an illustration, in the report relating to the elections in Kenya, it is noted that technology has been a critical aspect of Kenyan elections. However, it continues to pose significant challenges, particularly with regards to dissemination of hate speech, disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation on social media platforms during elections time. The report issued on the elections for Gambia commended that the internet was not restricted during the 2021 elections, a departure from the 2016 elections. Whereas in Uganda, the implementation of an internet shutdown during the 2021 general elections by the government was noted. In this regard, I wish to take the opportunity to underscore that internet and social media shutdowns violate the right to freedom of expression and access to information, contrary to Article 9 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. In, this, in its resolution on the right to freedom of information and expression on the internet in Africa, adopted during the 59th Ordinary Session held in November 2016, the African Commission recognized the importance of the internet in advancing human and people's rights in Africa, particularly the right to freedom of information and expression, and condemned the emerging practice of state parties of interrupting or limiting access to telecommunication services such as the internet, social media, and messaging services increasingly during elections time. I would like to underscore principle 38 of a Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, which expressly provides that states should not interfere with the right of individuals to seek, receive, and impart information through any means of communication and digital technologies, through measures such as the removal, blocking, or filtering of content, unless such interference is justifiable and compatible with international human rights laws and standards, and further that states should not engage in or condone any disruption of access to the internet and other digital technologies for segments of the public or an entire population. Ladies and gentlemen, this issue is merely one of the areas discussed in the reports which are being launched today. During this webinar, several other aspects related the realization of the right of access to information during elections will be discussed. I urge all participants to take advantage of this opportunity to actively participate in the discussions related to the specific reports in addition to the access to information landscape in Africa in general. I hope the webinar will also be provide a useful opportunity to raise awareness on the guidelines on access to information and uh, elections in Africa and the work done by the African Commission in this regard. Allow me to conclude by reiterating the importance of an informed citizenry and electorate which can meaningfully engage in the democratic process. This is anchored by the right of access to information. I urge all stakeholders to continue to play their part to ensure that the right of access to information is protected, promoted and fulfilled. Once again, I wish to thank the Center for convening this useful discussion. Thank you, and I wish you all very fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, indeed, uh, Commissioner, for, for the keynote um, address. And I noticed that in your address, you are continuously making reference to the aspect of, of technology in the context of, of elections, in the context of access to information and freedom of expression. And when we look back at you know, the work of the commission in 2002, when the, the first declaration was adopted, that is an area which was not envisaged around that time. But when we move now to the current, the 2019 declaration, there is a, a strong emphasis on uh, the issue of, uh, you know, the internet as a, uh, an essential element of, of access to information and freedom of expression, and also the guidelines themselves that we are looking at today speak to the issue of uh, technology as well. So thank you so much for, for, for the remarks. 
Um, if you have been uh, following the work of the commission, you would notice that this particular mandate um, for a very long time was, uh, you know, headed by uh, advocate Pansy Tlakula, who actually initiated the process of uh, the drafting of the guidelines on, on access to information and, and elections in Africa. And um, I'm happy to also uh, announce that she is there and um, she, she's following the, the proceedings also online or on this particular platform. Uh, Advocate Pansi Tlakula, thank you very much for the work that you initiated um, on the continent in developing the normative standards of the African Commission, the model law on access to information, the guidelines on access to information and elections and also initiated the process of revising the Declaration on Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in, in Africa. And uh, that work is indeed much appreciated. I don't know, Advocate Pansit Lakula, if um, uh, our participants can hear your voice in like two minutes or so. No, thank you very much. I'm I'm just joining as a participant and thank you very much for recognizing me and uh, also to greet uh, my former uh, colleague, uh, Lawrence Mute and the current special rapporteur to congratulate the center for the sterling work that uh, you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Advocate Pansit Lakula. For those that are not aware, she is now the chairperson of the Information Regulator in South Africa, a body whose mandate is also on access to information, but also protection of personal information. Thank you, Advocate. Now we'll move on to um, the stage where we are presenting to you our findings of uh, the reports that are being launched today. And uh, what is interesting with the panel that we have of uh, the speakers is that some of them were involved actually in the drafting of the guidelines themselves. If you look at the guidelines, you know, the name of uh, Jagan will pop up. Um, at the point of uh, the adoption of the guidelines, um, Lawrence Mute is a uh, commissioner and uh, you know vice chairperson of the African Commission actually led the process of, of the adoption. So it's a very exciting exercise um, in, in that regard to see that they were not just involved in developing the guidelines, but now they are involved in actually making use of, of that instrument. I'll now hand over to uh, my co-moderator, Sarah from Article 19, um, Eastern Africa. Sarah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Klingiwe, and thank you to all participants and everyone who took the time to join us today. As Klingiwe said, my name is Sarah Wesonga. I am a policy and advocacy specialist, and I lead Article 19's work on transparency and access to information in the Eastern Africa region. Uh, proactive disclosure of information is fundamental to the integrity of any elections, and I think my colleagues, my senior colleagues, as well as uh, the Honorable Commissioner have really emphasized this. And at a time when Africa's fabric of democracy is incredibly fragile, I think the role of access to information as a cornerstone of any legitimate democracy cannot be overstated. So without further ado, I think I shall kickstart this session with the presentation of key findings from uh, the research in the countries that we've done. Uh, but before we start, uh, just a few notes on the format of this session is that each speaker will have 15 minutes to make their presentation and then five minutes to answer the preliminary questions. Uh, for the participants, please note that we won't be taking any oral questions during the presentation. So should you have any questions for the speakers as they present, please feel free to type it out on the Q&A or in the chat section. Uh, there will be an opportunity to submit oral input during the Q&A sessions after all the presenters have spoken, but to keep the discourse going, I encourage you to write down your questions and also feel free to contribute during the Q&A session. And so to start, we will start with our researcher for Ghana, uh, Mr. Michael Gyanyako. Michael Gunn is currently the manager of the litigation and implementation unit at the Center for Human Rights, University of Pretoria. He also serves on the editorial committee of the African Human Rights Yearbook and, and, and does the editing for the center's blog. His rich such interests include international human rights law, the African human rights systems, and the impact of implementing international human rights law in national and legal systems. He is the author of several books on journal papers 
papers and human rights and democratization in Africa, and has been a fundamental part in putting together our report for Ghana. So Mr. Michael, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, good, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure to present the report on Ghana on behalf of uh, the authors, just to mention that I'm one of the co-authors of, of, of the report. And um, the, the structure of the report essentially is to provide some context to the, the political history of Ghana uh, in terms of elections, and then delve into specifically the challenges with access to information uh, with particular reference to the electoral process. And then um, I will highlight some of the challenges that we noticed with the current legislative and policy regime with regards to access to information uh, during elections and some of the recommendations that uh, the, the report makes um, um, for consideration. So, um, I mean, any person who is a student of history will understand that Ghana has had a very checkered political history um, starting from 1957 when uh, independence was obtained from the colonial power, uh, Britain at the time. And since then, there has been an alternation of democratic regimes interspersed by a number of uh, military regimes, uh, beginning with the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah in 1966 and the formation of a military government at the time. And between 1966 and 1993, when Ghana returned to uh, multi-party democracy, there were a number of uh, short-lived uh, civilian regimes interspersed with long periods of military overthrows and coup d'etats that disrupted uh, elections and, and uh, democratic governance um, in Ghana. But then since the, the coming into existence of the 1992 constitution um, uh, and the, the election of a new uh, democratic government uh, that came into power on the 7th of January 1993, there has been a new dispensation for multi-party democracy underpinned by the 1992 constitution, which uh, provides the basis for democratic elections that are supposed to be free and fair and ensure that the government of the country is legitimately elected by the, the, the populace. The current electoral system is uh, evidently the first past the post um, system with a unicameral legislature, which is comprised of uh, members of parliament that are elected on the tickets of either political parties or independent candidates. And these candidates are in elected in designated constituencies um, so that it is not the, you know, the party list where the political parties decide based on the percentage of uh, that you obtain through elections. Each um, per parliamentary candidate has to contest on a particular in a particular constituency, and they they may contest on the on the ticket of a political party or as an independent candidate. Um, and in the parliamentary elections, the the person who secures the majority of the votes is elected as the member of parliament. Whilst in the presidential elections, um, the person who secured more than fifty percent of the votes is is, is declared um, as the elected uh, candidate for, 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 for the elections. Um, the conduct of the elections itself is uh, underpinned by the right to political participation, which is guaranteed in the constitution. Uh, and the constitution also guarantees the right to access information uh, in terms of uh, Article 21F of the constitution, which guarantees the right of everyone to access information subject to laws that may be necessary in a democratic uh, society. So that in, in essence, there, there is a fundamental constitutional basis for the pro uh, protection of the right to information in all spheres of public, uh, including um, during e e elections. Uh, the, 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 the constitutional provision also requires uh, that the parliament adopts legislation which is supposed to, um, if you like, concretize the enjoyment of this particular right to access information. Um, however, it took a, a significant period of time 
um, before an actual bill. The, well, the bill was presented in Parliament in 1999, but the Right to Information Act actually only was uh, enacted and assented to uh, by the president in 2019. You know, uh, 20 years after the first uh, right information bill was actually presented in, in, in Parliament. And in the intervening period, in the absence of uh, legislation and, you know, uh, essentially implementing the right to access to information, uh, access to information was usually a contested issue and in many instances actually ended up being litigated in court uh, because public uh, Officers usually refused to grant access to to in, in information uh, when demanded by members of 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 the public. Now, in the in the context of the the, the Right to Information Act of twenty nineteen that uh, was assented to uh, quite recently, all public institutions are obliged to uh, compile and publish an up to date. Uh, public interest information uh, manuals that should essentially indicate to the public the kind of information that is being held by the particular entities, including the electoral management body, which is the Electoral Commission of Ghana, and to ensure that the information that is in the custody of the entity is classified into information that may be assessed uh, by the public at a cost or at no cost, um, the particular officer or information officer from whom the information may be requested and the procedure through which a member of the, of the public may actually request uh, for the information from the, the, the particular public entity. Uh, the Act also makes provision for information that is exempt from disclosure and this in terms of the Right Information Act includes information that is prepared for submission to the President uh, with the exception of factual or statistical data information and that is uh, presented for cabinet meetings for uh, public policy deliberations that are not yet made public um, with the exception of statistical information and information that is related to law enforcement uh, and public safety. So that uh, the exclusions from disclosure uh, are quite limited um even though in in the context of uh you know, public safety and national security we see that in in a number of instances these are some of the major excuses that are that are used to to deny um access to to, to information that is you know um, usually requested by the the public from public institutions of course they are also exemptions in the general sense of uh, information that is usually considered to be confidential, uh, privilege information relating to lawyer-client relationship, spousal relationship, doctor-patient, and those are things that are not you know, uh, generally contentious. Perhaps the one part of the, the Right to Information Act that is a little bit uh, unsettling is the requirement that the, the right to access information is actually uh, only with regards to public institutions um, and there is not a broad uh, you know definition in uh, as the model law and the guidelines uh, edge states to guarantee access to information that may be held by uh, private individuals or institutions that may be necessary for um, if you like the vindication of 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 the rights of uh, other persons so uh, the act does define public institutions to include private institutions or organizations that receive public resources for the performance of their functions. However, it does not extend to those institutions that does not receive public information, but which nonetheless may have access to certain information that uh, individuals may need uh, for, the, for the, the protection of, of, of their rights. There's also a deficiency with the nature of the discretion that is given to public officials um, in the ability to decide to refuse access to information where the application is deemed to be manifestly frivolous or vex vexatious. And this is particularly concerning in the context of the fact that the, the right to access information is 
is is is not based on justification. It is based on the democratic uh, principle of transparency um, that ensures that the organs of state and the individuals that uh, we either appoint or elect to man these organs of state provide information to the public as the public uh, deserves to know. And it's not that the requester must have a justification why they require access to, to, to in, in, in information. It is a matter of right that should uh, necessarily be provided to the public on request if, if uh, a requester was minded to make such a request to the public without the, the need to provide you know, um, justification for the, the, the request for, for, for that um, particular in, in information. So that in the, in the context of, of the act itself, uh, these are some of you know, the, the glaring deficiencies that um, we noticed uh, are quite concerning and that needs to you know, be, be taken a second look at in any future law reform process with regards to access to information. Um, despite these challenges with the act, it, it actually does provide a good first step, a uh, first step towards operationalizing the right to access to information that is guaranteed in, in, the, in the constitution. And if well implemented, could provide you know, a free, free and open society where information is easily accessible from public institutions, including the electoral commission uh, upon request by, by the, the public. In terms of uh, our own observations of the electoral process uh, during the 2020 elections and how the new law was implemented or not implemented um, by the Electoral Commission and some of the, the challenges that were associated with the election, um, I think the one of the controversies that uh, were associated with the election was essentially the decision of the commission in the middle of the pandemic to conduct a voter registration exercise and the complaints by a lot of people in the public that uh, this might not be the most um, wise use of resources because the, the the pandemic was a situation that had you know led to a public emergency that kept a lot of people away from public spaces and therefore, uh, people felt that perhaps this was a, um, a registration that could be reserved for a future time when there actually was space and the, the resources to 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 conduct you know a registration that would be deemed by the public to to be legitimate um, conduct of, of of elections. Uh, the EC itself is established under the constitution, uh, the electoral commission, uh, that's what I mean by the EC, and an electoral commission act that sets out requirements that members of the commission are supposed to comply with. Uh, the details of the members of the uh, are easily accessible on the website of, of, of the electoral commission, um, which comprehensively indicates the, um, the members that are currently serving you know, on, on the on the commission, uh, their portfolios and the the means through which the public may be able to access them for information if, if necessary. The Electoral Commission also periodically uh, publishes information on its website uh, related to the conduct of elections. Um, one of the challenges that we, we noticed with the access to information was in, in a number of instances, the decline of request for information uh, that were made to the electoral commission. And initially the, the requests were being denied on the basis that uh, even though the access to information law had been passed, the, the fees and the charges that were applicable to information that is provided for the public had not yet been you know, determined in regulations. And the electoral commission was essentially using this as an excuse uh, to deny people access to, to uh, information that was uh, requested by the public. And there was one particular instance where there was actually a member of parliament who requested information relating to the, proc the, to the procurement of biometric voter 
management systems and the electoral commission refused to provide the information um, on the basis that they didn't know how much money to charge uh, you know uh, and that of course not a good argument but that was a, a sufficient basis for them to refuse access to information and it took the high court to intervene to actually compel the electoral commission um to provide this this information to to the member of parliament and essentially uh to to, to the public um in terms of the way the electoral commission communicates to the public uh, we found sufficient information that the electoral commission communicates to the public usually proactively through its uh, website but also in a number of instances in you know pub public and private radio and television platforms uh, where information is generally uh, made uh, publicly available. The main challenge that we found, especially with publications that are on the EC's website uh, and other platforms, would be the language accessibility, where most of the information that is published is prim prim uh, primarily in English. And um, we know Ghana is a culturally and linguistically diverse uh, society, so yeah. that it makes it uh, difficult to have access to information that is only presented in one language and is not also presented in, uh, you know, some of the the major uh, local languages that uh, are widely sp spoken among the communities. Of course, information that is uh, on radio and television tends to be more diverse when it comes to language accessibility, but the actual published information usually uh, you know, ends up uh, being only in, in English and, and that an area that needs to thank you thank uh, you michael um in the interest of time i'd ask you to wind up but also as you wind up we have some questions on the chat for you uh the first question is from dennis omondi asking whether there is an additional threshold for one to be declared as a president elect other than having majority of votes cast second question from the same participant Proactive disclosure of electoral data and information helps mitigate information distortion challenges. What ways does the EMB proactively disclose electoral data or information during voter roll, audit of reports of the rolls, electoral results, and procurement of electoral materials, ETC? And the last question is from, Ms. from Anthony Julis. What criteria determines whether whether at cost or no cost to access information when the beneficiaries for such transparency information are generally the poorest in society. I hope you'll be able to address this as you wind up your presentation. Thank you. Yes, and I'm, I'm going to wind up quickly. Uh, just to also mention one of the, the deficiencies we found was the general lack of uh, information on, on political parties on the website of the Electoral Commission. And if it does exist, it's quite in an inconspicuous space that the public cannot easily access. I mean, I have tried several times to look for the number of registered political parties on the website of the Electoral Commission, and I have not been able to access any information that relates to, you know, uh, registered political parties. So that even though the public is quite aware of a number of political parties because of public campaigns and stuff like that, the EC itself does not provide a public record of such information on its website. and that can be quite a challenge for being able to access credible information uh, on, on, on uh, registered political parties. Just to uh, quickly wind up with some of the recommendations and then I will try to address the, the questions that uh, are raised. I think for us, um, the recommendations that we make broadly relates to what we think should be a reform of the Rights to Information Act itself um, to basically include information that is held by public individuals and, and institutions that may be necessary for the medication of rights of, 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 of other you know, uh, organizations or individuals. Because you know, in, the, in the information age, we know that uh, information is held by a lot of organizations, uh, especially telecommunication, internet service providers, and other institutions that do have significant amount of information that could be useful to the public. And without a legislative basis for being able to make such requests from those institutions or individuals, there is a bit of deficiency in, in being able to access in, information. Also, that uh, this issue of you know blatant refusal of is on what the the institution might deem to be frivolous. Uh, really, is 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 quite curious because it it should not be uh, for the 
the, the person holding the information to decide what the motivation of the individual wanting the information should be. If the information is of a public interest and is, you know, uh, information that the public requires, the law should require that uh, the institution should make it accessible to to the to the public at at no cost or or at uh, um, a minimal cost. Um, we also um, recommend that the electoral commission itself should develop a comprehensive internal internal policy on proactive disclosure of information, uh, especially information that relates to the political players, political parties. Yeah, uh, funding uh, sources, uh, you know, uh, expenditure. We, these are information that is required to be published, but which is almost uh, never published uh, or if published at all, only through reports that are made to parliament and not on you know, publicly accessible uh, websites such as the Electoral Commission's own um, website. Uh, we also recommend that um, the processes that leads to the, the passage of, you know, constitutional instruments that um, usually are the legislative basis on which the electoral commission works. Uh, usually is not very, very transparent to the public and the public is not able to participate in a lot of these discussions, which then creates, you know, later confusion on what exactly is the motivation of the electoral commission, what the public interest is, then perhaps there's a need for more communication uh, to, to, to be provided to the public. And thank you, thank you, Michael. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so yeah. in the interest of time, I think you've uh, mentioned uh, that you've uh, answered the question on costs. So I'll fill the other two questions for the Q&A session. Uh, you'll be able to answer the questions before we take any other questions from the participants. But thank you so much for your presentation and your insights on uh, the proactive disclosure and elections in Ghana. Uh, and I will come back to you. So without further ado, please allow me to move on to um, our next panelist and uh, presenter, who is Mr. Mr. Daniel Ronald Rueza from Uganda. Uh, Daniel Rueza is a senior lecturer and the acting head of Department of Law and Jurisprudence School of Law at Makerere University. He is the coordinator of the LLM Human Rights and Democratization in Africa program and also the patron of the Mood Society at the school. His research interests uh, include various areas of international criminal law, transitional justice, critical approaches to law and development, amongst others. Uh, Daniel has been critical in putting together our report for Uganda, and we're excited to hear more from him. And uh, before he starts, I'll just remind uh, you, uh, the participants to keep on uh, jotting down their questions on the Q&A part, and uh, he will be able to address them either at the end of the session or during the Q&A session. So without further ado, welcome, Mr. Rueza. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, our moderator, for having me and for inviting me to uh, this uh, launch. The report from Uganda, uh, compiled by Dr. Peter Sasira and myself, um, is a very interesting one. Um, Uganda has a history that uh, is divided. Uh, we have, of course, like Ghana and most of the other colonial, post-colonial states, um, the, the background of having um, ethnic violence and divisions that have, um, to a large extent, uh, been the backdrop of our history and have influenced a lot of how we do our politics as a result of that we've had a lot of bloodshed, uh, violence, uh, among other things. Tribal and ethnic uh, agendas do not necessarily um, uh, fade away during elections. Uh, they continue to happen. Uh, the use of violence does still exist uh, and continues to, to, to happen. And of course, the, the use of militarization is not something that we hide or can run away from. Uh, the story of violence and oppression continues, and that is the backdrop. So when we have politics uh, of a multi-democratic nature or multi-party nature, we are bound to have these challenges erupt once again as they have continued to do so in our country. 
So the story of violence continues. Uh, briefly in Uganda, we have had uh, the, the the impact of um, the impact of divide divided loyalties uh, by independence. We had a very interesting uh, independence organize independence constitution that had both a federal, semi federal, and unitary government structure. It lasted only four years. And then there was the first military coup in Uganda in 1966. And so Uganda has continued to have quite a number of uh, coups guitar, uh, taking place in our nation um, until 1986, uh, when 20 years back, where, 20 years later after 1966, when President Museveni uh, came into power. We had presidential elections in 2016, and um, there was, of course, evidence of violence uh, where the main opposition candidate, Dr. Kiza CJ, uh, was placed under house arrest, detained. Um, uh, we, we had a ban on social media, among other things. So come 2021, we continue to have the culmination of these tensions in our country. Um, some of the challenges uh, included voter intimidation, uh, internet shutdown, voting irregularities, uh, crackdowns by security forces of opposition, election monitors, uh, among others. The election was not only about power, uh, but about who, of course, would control and access information. And that is why uh, it was uh, helpful to those in power to have the internet shut down. As a result, we did not have easy access to information as quickly as we would have wanted uh, it to, to happen. Um, so this was clearly um, an attack on the right of information to information of most of the um, of the people of you of all the people of Uganda, and so that is where we sought uh, to have that research done. The main stakeholders at uh, in Uganda um, are the electoral commission, and um, interestingly, at uh, the twenty twenty one elections had the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, which also was used either positively or negatively to bring about a limitation on the ability of people or persons to be able to access information and uh, access their, 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 their the electorate uh, and so on. So there was much more restriction in that re regard. And because of the kind of uh, research that, that we, we, we had to do, uh, obviously, because the 2021 elections were branded scientific general elections, um, we it was hard to access some of the key stakeholders that would have ideally wanted to easily uh, uh, access. Uh, that is because uh, most of the information or most of the players uh, were not easily available and as some of you may already know, we had a lot of uh, um, uh, influence from state, 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 state functionaries and security uh, personnel. The other thing you would like maybe to know is that Uganda had both parliamentary and presidential elections uh, being held uh, concurrently. And, and, um, and, and, and that, of course, had an impact on how effectively the Electoral Commission of Uganda would function. Um, at the end of the day, we had about 59% of the 18 million uh, voters participating uh, with the president of Uganda garnering 59% of the vote and uh, Chagulani, Honorable Chagulani, also called Bobby Wine, getting 58% of the vote. And then there are other votes uh, that came up uh, thereafter. So um, what then were the key findings that we could uh, talk about that, uh, that, that maybe you could uh, take home? 
uh, we have basically three or four in, in, in important uh, legislations that we would like to talk about domestically. The Constitution of Uganda guarantees, uh, it guarantees uh, access to information from e for every uh, citizen of Uganda. And this has been well pronounced in the, by the courts of law. We also have an Access to Information Act, which was enacted in 2005. We have regulations that were also uh, en enacted in that regard. However, the challenge has been um, the fact that there are other legislations like the Public Order Management Act that have to a large extent been misused uh, by the by the by the for, by by the implementing powers by the by the state uh, in that regard. So on, on many occasions, permission has to be sought ideally for them, for people to gather. And that is a, a, a challenge. Some of the criticisms cited were the big part that has to be pay, played by the, uh, um, by, the, uh, by, by the executive in first of all, appointing the, um, the election management body, which is the uh, electoral uh, commission. Um, uh, and that has a, a huge say in what people think about. And so when you compare the guidelines to that, there is a, a, a big problem. Issues such as record keeping, access procedures also become uh, a big issue or were a big issue in, in that regard. Um, the electoral calendar um, and so on became a, a challenge for us um, uh, as a nation if you if you took that into consideration. The other challenges came with the registration of political parties and the entire management process totally. The electoral commission is to a large extent limited in what it can and cannot do. Um, it may be able to license certain uh, providers, uh, for example, election observers, uh, but at the same time, it may not be able to guarantee their ability to do their work uh, very well. And with the shutdown of the internet, it became uh, equally difficult uh, for monitoring uh, to be able uh, to happen properly. So you find technical glitches, delays, and so on, which cannot be easily uh, reported in that regard. Now, because uh, we, we may not have a, a lot of time very quickly, uh, some of the key stakeholders uh, in this um, electoral process were the political parties. Uh, they are governed by the Political Parties and Organizations Act, um, but in the current status quo that we have in the nation, it's a bit difficult for them to exercise their, um, their rights and freedoms easily or to have access to information. So disclosure by some of these political parties is often difficult, uh, something that even continues to happen up to today. Yes, they may have a constitution, but disclosure of a lot of information is not that easy. Some proactive um, political parties like the NRM, FDC, National Unity Platform may easily have their documents available um, online, uh, but you may not be able to easily get information when you visit uh, their, their offices as quickly as you'd want to. Um, there have been challenges regarding symbols, logos, and trademarks uh, with the state sometimes coming in when it comes to challenging logos and some people being arrested as a result of that. It's difficult to find the number of registered voters for these political parties. Uh, sometimes the criteria for nomination is not very easy. So the report goes on and on. I will just rush to the recommendations because we don't have a lot of, of time. Uh, so that you can have a, a bit of an idea of what we are recommending. So I'll just look down to uh, to the very end uh, where you can see our recommendations. Okay. So the first recommendation that we give um, in this report is with regard to um, media and, and internet that there should be really, really, really uh, a removal from uh, 
from access to the internet during this process because the internet has become the most efficient way in which people can get uh, their information easily. And we have seen that that has been quite quite a challenge. Budgetary, uh, budgetary uh, constraints have also been a problem for both the enforcers and the participants, and we find that that has to be dealt with. Some of the legislation, like the Access to Information Act, needs to be um, uh, amended so as to make it easier for people to access information, information regarding deployment, budgetary allocations, and so on. Uh, we, we really would like that to happen. We, re we recommend also a restraint on the use of force, uh, which has been such a big problem uh, to many of us. We have run out of time for this presentation. I will stop at this point. Um, but I'm glad that you'll access the report and maybe ask some questions uh, in case any arise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Obviously, Uganda's our neighbors is a very interesting country to us, and we've been looking at the electoral process quite keenly. I am going to the Q&A function and just reminding all participants to that we won't be taking oral input during the presentations. And please, if you have any questions, use the Q&A function. And so uh, I will start with a question from Jenny Tamwe, who asks that in the DRC, journalists are arrested and political opponents silenced. How can you help the people to get a real access to information in the upcoming elections? I don't know if this question is just to you, Daniel, or uh, you know, for a broader discussion later. Jane says, thank you. Anthony, in Uganda, can Electoral Commission on, of Uganda use its constitutional mandate to proactively access public information aimed at resolving conflicts of interest between the state and society? I'll repeat, in Uganda, can the Electoral Commission of Uganda use its constitutional mandate to proactively access public information aimed at resolving conflicts of interest between the states and society. And the last question uh, is more of a contribution. And it says access to information, which is often very difficult, is very important. And as such, CSOs need to devise alternative paths. For example, during the 2018 presidential campaign in Cameroon, we used PVC, the PVC project uh, through which every citizen was made a potential election reporter and all possibilities of falsifications of vote counts were greatly reduced. Um, I think the last question is from uh, Benedict, who asked, how is the awareness of freedom of expression and rule of law in Africa? And what would be the recommendations to African countries? So Daniel, I don't know what questions you're able to answer at this time, but please feel free to proceed. We have five minutes for you to answer these questions. All right, I'll, I'll very quickly re refer to the to maybe this, the, this third last and the last question. Yes, it is true that the Electoral Commission can access information. We have the enabling role, and I think many of you have heard the fact that has always been said that Uganda has the, the laws and policies, but the challenge comes with implementation. So if you become a person of interest, it is very easy for this information uh, to be received. Unfortunately, the, sometimes the information may not be received through uh, legitimate means, and so it is up to the legal office um, of the of the electoral commission uh, to do the right thing, make the correct applications using the Access to Information Act. And there are other stakeholders that can help us, especially the media and the inspectorate of government. And there have been cases where the inspectorate of government has actually brought leaders to book, if it, especially leaders who, who are democratically elected. Um, so that is possible. Uh, the, the question is, is it done fairly? You know, most of the criticism will be you're doing it for those in opposition, you're not doing it for those who are not in opposition. But yes, uh, it can be done. Uh, the question regarding, uh, the, the last question was with regard to can African leaders, uh, could you say that again? Can African, can African people, could, could you repeat that? Please unmute. 
was muted, sorry. Um, the last question is from Benedict, who, asks, who is asking, how is the awareness of freedom of expression and rule of law in Africa? And what would be what would be like the recommendation from African countries? Basically, he's asking yeah. uh, awareness around the FOE yeah. in, in, in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the biggest challenge to access to information today has been the shutting down of the internet. Uh, I strongly believe that with the shutting down of the internet, a lot of information can no longer be shared, especially in these vital times. That is why, of course, the government has to have a very efficient machine that, that controls Controls how the internet at the same time being able to allow people to access internet. But once internet has been shut down, there is no information. People cannot communicate to one another. It 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 helps uh, the state to be able to control the information, but to a large extent, it does not do well for people to believe and trust the results that finally come out uh, of the system. Yeah, that is where, the, in my view, the biggest challenge is. It is so challenging because even private media are not able to do their work very well. And as we note in our report, there must be some leeway given to private media to be able to follow up. But once they are not able to, then it's such a big challenge. So the internet has become so key. Uh, communication is quite difficult. Phone calls may not be as efficient anymore. Uh, sometimes people want real-time updates with pictures and videos to be able to take action quickly. Um, we, 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 that is something that we need to continue having the conversation about. Thank you very much. The rest, I think, were comments, and I, and I acknowledge them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniel. And most importantly, thank you for keeping time. Uh, we note uh, the hands by Miguel Antonio and Sine Crude. Please note you'll be allowed to uh, share your oral input at the end of all presentations. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to use the Q&A uh, function. Uh, for our next presenter, we are going to receive a presentation from Jagan Gray Johnson, who's the advocacy manager for the Open Society Africa. Mr. Johnson has previously led the anti-corruption cluster of the Open Society Foundations, and he is a founding member of the multi-sectoral working group against corruption. He has led many campaigns with the Pan-African Parliament that ushered the African Charter of Democracy, Elections and Governance in 2020. 12, and he is the focal point of an 11 country study to influence policy reforms on media legislation frameworks. He has overseen numerous publications around African democracy and human rights framework, and as our lead consultant for the Gambia's uh, report on guidelines on elections and ATI in Africa, we are very much pleased to have him. Mr. Jagan Gray Johnson, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. I hope you can hear me clearly. Very clearly, thank you. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much, um, colleagues. Um, before I start my presentation, um, let me just quickly thank um, several individuals that uh, were instrumental um, in assisting me, um, specifically with this uh, chapter on the Gambia, but more generally, um, bringing this whole exercise into fruition. So Yusuf Taylor and Said Matijau were my... Um, my, my national um, researchers and, and assisted me greatly um, in, uh, in compiling um, this um, evidence-based um, material that I'm about to present to you this morning. Um, but also to say a very big thanks to advocate Panzi Taklula, um, who was at the time when we were putting this together, um, that uh, Lengue talked about uh, and also um, um, Lloyd talked about earlier, um, she was the one that really started us off um, in uh, putting together the concept um, and uh, putting together some of this work. She's now the South African um, information regulator. And I saw that she was on the call earlier. Um, if she's still on, just to say a big thank you to you, Advocate um, uh, Takluda. Uh, and then also to Lawrence Muti, um, who was also at this point in time um, doing an, uh, performing a very important role um, as a member of the commission and also basically over, overseeing issues around access to information. Um, I know that he was also the author um, for the country report for, for Kenya, but just to acknowledge him in his role, um, that basically um, assisted us to get to the level that we've gotten to. And finally, to Maxwell, 
Uh, Maxwell, thank you so much for being the country reviewer for the Gambia, but more importantly, also being a colleague of mine that was involved um, in, in drafting these guidelines um, so many years ago. So with that, um, I'm going to start very quickly um, to state that um, I'm going to go straight to the findings. Um, before going to the findings, though, I think for every stakeholder, what I will attempt to do is just to give you um, just a very, very brief snapshot of the challenges that we're seeing um, in, in, in terms of an impediment um, to access to information more broadly, and more specifically um, to access to information on elections, as this particular study stipulates. Um, I think it goes without saying that um, the culture of secrecy um, and suspicion of probity and resentment of even questioning public affairs um, of the state um, is still prevalent in the Gambia. That's the challenge that we're seeing. Um, the Barrow administration has practically uh, mimicked the machinations of its predecessor, which was uh, Yaya Jame, as to how information is hoarded, economically dispensed, and involuntarily divulged. So reform has been laboriously slow. Um, in essence, I think um, very little has changed to a point where Amnesty International even issued a report on the 23rd of September um, 2021. This was about 75 days or so before the presidential elections in which it lamented the broken promises um, of President Adam Abaro made five years earlier to prioritize and urgently um, embark on reforms. And this clarion call is not necessarily a call in a vacuum. It encompasses um, these very fundamental issues um, that we're talking about here today. So in essence, this report's assessment um, of uh, Gambia's compliance um, to the AU guidelines of access to information has generally actually exposed a wide gap across the board. So in other words, all the election stakeholders um, we found fell short of meeting the criteria that would demonstrate and present the evidence of a democratic state supported and sustained by the principles of transparency and information retention, as well as retrieval and sharing within a system anchored in legal and policy frameworks that encourage and support public consultation and citizen participation in public affairs, as well as looking at elevating the demand for public accountability. So that's really what this in essence seeks to measure, right? So we also found out that the 1997 constitution is inherently weak in ensuring that principles of accountability um, are actually elevated. One of the good things, however, um, in all of this um, 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 picture of despondency is the fact that um, you know, there is actually um, now an access to information law that has the potential to cause a seismic shift in my opinion, in the transparency and accountability domains and to register um, strong governance and a positive impact in the consolidation of sound democratic practice in the Gambia. So, but, you know, again, that's one thing on paper, but in reality, this can only occur if there is political will and a collective ambition to marshal and institutionalize and operationalize the Access, the access to Information Act um, of 2021. Um, I think if this is done, then there's a possibility to at least effectively hold um, to account those public officials who oversee critical state assets, right? Um, that includes um, infrastructure, monetary, and national and other, and other resources, right? And as well as the regulatory mechanisms um, around the social, economic, judicial, and political entities. So that's a, that, that, that's a start. Um, in, in essence, um, again, some of the recommendations um, that we make um, based on this very broad picture that I painted um, in, in, in terms of the impediment um, to implementing ATIs on elections. Um, one of the recommendations, and you can lo look at it inversely. So I'm presenting the recommendations, one in the interest of time, but obviously also to allow us to apply our minds to the inverse, right? So if the recommendation is X, then obviously the, the, cha the, 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 challenges, the, the, the challenges that are posed to, to actually bring this recommendation to being um, is the fact that there's a deficiency um, in the recommendation that we're putting forward, right? So one of the things that we're asking um, Gambia government um, and the National Assembly essentially um, is to first and foremost, reintroduce the 2020 draft constitution um, to the new assembly, which is the sixth assembly for swift passage um, so that we can go to a referendum and let the citizens decide how they wish to be governed. Um, and I think um, if this is not possible, um, then it, for the very least, um, to look at implementation, the recommendations of the National Human Rights Commission's advisory notes 
um, on the Elections Act vis-a-vis -vis the 1997 Constitution um, um, uh, as they looked at it with the 2020 draft um, Constitution. Um, the second recommendation is to fast track and institutionalize and operationalize the access of information, the act itself, right? Processes and um, as, as required uh, by, 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 um, by the National Assembly. Um, but they have to now start really basically ro start lo rolling it out, which they haven't. Um, to also ensure that there's a political party funding act, um, which doesn't exist, which provides legislation for the annual disbursement of public money to political parties that are represented in the National Assembly based on the best practices that we've seen in other AU member states. The second set of rec recommendations that we make into the Gambia government through the National Assembly is to look at regulating um, private funding, right? Um, so donations to political parties um, and also devise a mechanism requiring the disclosure of all donations above, for example, 50,000 dollars. Um, which is in uh, in US dollars, not a lot. Um, under under uh, I think uh, what four three thousand odd US dollars, right? By political parties, and we're also looking at um, um, the the general overhaul um, reform and of the appointment processes of the electoral independent commission, right? The commissioners themselves. That one, it needs to reflect the independence, integrity, credibility, and national character of the country. There has to be gender balance. There has to be intergenerational mix. There has to be religious minorities and people with disabilities uh, that are represented in these appointments um, so that it is responsive to the demands of a modern elections management body. Um, and even the process itself needs to be looked at. So commissioners now um, are generally appointed um, through the Public Service Commission um, on the wills and caprices of uh, the president. We're saying that needs to change. Um, I think commissioners, yes, are to be appointed by the president, but they have to go through a short list, um, through a public process for vetting and interviewing the candidates, led by the National Assembly, members of the Interparty Committee, and the public commission. So therefore, all the stakeholders are actually involved in this particular process. Um, and the final set of recommendations, again, um, that we're looking at is, you know, the regulation of uh, donations of political parties that I talked about. I think more importantly, also what we're recommending um, very, very thoroughly is to ensure that the disenfranchisement of the diaspora is halted. Um, people, Gambians that are not residing in the Gambia cannot vote, um, even though the constitution states that uh, they have a right to vote. Um, and also even given the fact that there was a court case that was taken um, by members of the diaspora against the IC and the Gambia government, whereby the, 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 the diasporans actually won, um, whereby the courts actually affirmed their right um, to be given the franchise. Um, finally, um, again, um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 the recommendations that we're making to the key stakeholders, I'll move on to the IEC. Um, the, 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 what we found is that, um, you know, the IEC has over the years been plagued by many challenges. And I think that's, um, you know, common to a lot of um, the, the, the election management bodies um, on the continent. But in the Gambia itself um, is the fact that, um, you know, one of which, you know, the major challenges that it has is of its own making. Um, and that is the attitude that, um, you know, is presented that the IEC seems to think that it's above the law. Um, it is unresponsive to probity and public criticism. Its unwillingness, um, you know, to engage with stakeholders um, is, is very obvious. Um, it doesn't want to be open and transparent. Um, it has, in many instances, been quite defensive. defensive. It's been combative. Um, and, uh, you know, the behavior that's perceived um, by a lot of the um, stakeholders um, has actually been captured um, in a scientific research by the Afrobarometer Survey. We found that despite the positive assessments of elections quality, only about half, which is 49% of the citizens, said that they trusted the IEC somewhat or a lot, and a significant decline be between um, when the survey was taken um, in 2021 um, to when the survey was initially taken in 2018 um, at 64%. So, Clearly, I think at the time that we were doing the study, um, it showed that the IEC was suffering from a trust deficit. Now, based on that, what are we recommending? Or what are we recommending for the IEC to do? Um, I think certainly one of the first things is that to adhere to the, um, the judgment um, and the court judgments against it. Um, again, to again, um, urgently um, address the disenfranchisement of the diaspora. 
I think we also putting forward the fact that uh, they need to implement the recommendations, obviously, of the various election observation missions um, that have made some very, very um, good um, recommendations as to how elections should be managed better, particularly around access to information on elections. And also, finally, to nurture and sustain a culture of proactive disclosure of its procurement, its contracting, and its appointment processes, which currently um, is a bit checkered. Um, the second set of recommendations, obviously, is to update the information on its website. It's quite dated. Um, it's, it's not consistently updated. Um, so that needs to happen. I think it needs to also look at facilitating access to information through record keeping, et cetera. So we need to, again, encourage the IEC to also promote active participation in electoral processes and exercises through systematic and sustained civic and democracy education programs. That has lacked um, over the period. Um, in terms of, again, access to information around the elections. Um, I'll move on very quickly um, on the findings of political parties. Um, we found out that there's been a proliferation of political parties in the last three years, and I think this is a good thing. However, uh, we thought that there's a need for a sharp and focused introspection by all political parties to reflect on the daunting issues that undermine the sustainability, credibility, and effectiveness of political entities, particularly political opposition. Um, one of the challenges that we found was um, access to information around leadership renewal um, is a problem. Um, all parties remain saddled with the burden of personality, where the party founder remains at the helm for virtually the entire life of the party. Again, this is not unique to Gambia, but these are the findings that we're finding on the, on the Gambia chapter. Um, again, um, we also found out that um, in, in terms of um, access to information, um, in terms of proactive disclosure, it's very clear that um, the undemocratic characteristics of political parties have also been exposed um, by the way in which coalitions are formed and alliances are formed. These formations are often not subject to internal party structures. It's not subjected to debates. It's not basically transparent. It is not open. You cannot access um, you know, the processes in which they went through um, to come about these um, coalitions or these alliances to a point where even the grand coalition that brought about the ouster of Yai Jami, who was, um, you know, the despot um, that everybody, uh, you know, knew about, and that basically caused a whole regional intervention in the Gambia <clears throat> in uh, 2017. That coalition of 2016 um, that brought about Adam Abaro to come in as president, um, the MOU um, is still shrouded in secrecy. We're still not sure whether it was signed or not. Um, so it tells you exactly where we are to a point where, again, <laughs> the Afrobarometer survey um, on the levels of mistrust of political parties um, basically placed political parties at the bottom of the trust ladder with the National Assembly members and local um, government councillors only enjoying 44% and 43% respectively of the public trust. Um, so again, that's a, that's a major challenge. So the recommendations, <coughs> excuse me, um, several. So we want them, political parties, to publicly disclose all assets and investments, um, to publicly dis disclose their financial arrangements as well as receipts of campaign funding. We want them to update their websites and ensure that the party consul, um, constituents um, have access um, to some of this um, 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 information. And also to, to disclose um, qualifications and assets of party leaders and their candidates, including elected officials, etc. So... Again, I will move very quickly on the election observation missions. Um, the election observation missions, um, we found out, have played <clears throat> a very critical role in strengthening Gambia's electoral processes um, through their technical and financial resources that they've given over the years um, in election observation. So again, overall, the reports have been <laughs> very good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Overall, the reports have been very good. I think it's well appreciated by all the stakeholders concerned. Um, they found them to be balanced, um, to be open, et cetera. But I think one of the critical things that we found was that the final reports of all election observation missions um, are not necessarily made accessible to the public in a timely manner. Although they're made accessible, but it's not in a timely manner as envisaged, for example, by the AU guidelines on access to information on elections. So namely within 30 days of the preliminary report and 90 days of their final reports. So when we were doing the research, we found out that uh, this was lacking. Um, the law enforcement agencies, very quickly, the Gambia Police um, Force um, generally works very closely with the elections, um, the Independent Elections um, 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 Commission, the IEC. 
Um, I think in the 2021 20, um, elections, um, they did a good job um, overall. Um, again, um, it enjoys some degree of public trust. 59% of the people polled stated that they trusted the institution. Um, however, one of the key findings is that there's a need for them to provide details of all reported election related crimes, which um, is not necessarily accessible, and also to include the number of cases reported and steps taken to investigate, prosecute, and to withdraw such cases. Um, on the key findings on the media and the internet regulatory bodies, um, the regulation. Thank you, thank you um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh. in the interest of time, um, I think we could briefly answer some of the questions that you have received, and then uh, we'll be able to uh, allow you some closing remarks during the uh, Q and A session. That's um, fine. I think. Yeah, thank you. So uh, you have a question from. Uh, uh, Joseph Patemba, who says access to information during an electoral process is also crucial uh, regarding the voting process, as most rigging allegations point to the voting process. Any recommendations in line with protecting the voting process as far as access to information is concerned? Uh, the next question is from Gita Higithuku, who says if a law regulating private giving is created, I'm guessing this is on, on, on the political parties. So if a law regulating private giving is created, would this not be used against CSOs or CSO movements? And um, again, Joseph asks about, I think it's the same question. Um, Sukati says currently in Swaziland, um, currently Swaziland is on election, but my main worry is how these elections are carried out, especially in the first stage as there's not much representation of human rights, particularly persons with disabilities. Um, so I'm guessing they are asking you to address participation of persons with disabilities in election. Um, another question about the Gambia, how is the implementation of the right to access information for voters? How about the implementation of rights to access to information for voters in detention centers or IDPs in any, if any in the Gambia? So they're asking access to information for IDPs. An anonymous attendee has said, African dictators often deny access to information during war. They close internet and mainstream medias and they commit heinous crimes, but are often rarely known to the world. Abi Ahmed's regime in Ethiopia has closed the internet and prohibited national and international mainstream media, not to access degree in many other regions in Ethiopia. The AU, Okay, so how do you see this commitment of the African Union on the protection and promotion of human rights in general and the freedom of expression in particular, uh, especially during conflict? So I'm guessing this is access to information uh, during conflict. The other question, oh, you have quite a number, so uh, I hope you'll be able to answer what you can and we'll fill the rest. The other question is from Mziwandile Ndlovu. In light of the trust deficit regarding IEC, how have the courts been reliable? How have the courts been a reliable arbitrator of electoral disputes? And the last question: In the Gambia, can the Electoral Commission initiate a collaboration with the National Assembly or any other public offices like the Office of the Auditor General for more transparent access of public information for joint accountability processes? Thank you. Um, you will handle what you're able to, and then we'll fill the rest for the next Q&A session, Jagan. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of questions. Um, I didn't get all of them, um, but let me start with the the last one um, on electoral disputes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think electoral disputes largely um, rests with the final arbiter in most cases would be the courts and the judiciary. Um, and in Gambia's case, um, there is a great deal of trust in the judiciary, although there's a bit of frustration because the wheels of justice turn very slowly. Um, in terms of fundamental reforms in making the judiciary more efficient um, and more, 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 more efficient, I'd say, not necessarily effective, but more efficient, um, that's been a challenge. Um, but in terms of electoral disputes, um, as, uh, as 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 it being um, bestowed on the courts as their mandate to adjudicate those matters, I think there's a great deal of trust um, in the judiciary. Um, certainly, a lot more. Um, you know, the trust deficit has has largely been closed um, from Jamis' time to Barris' time. That's one. Um, secondly, in terms of uh, the issues about voters' rights and IDPs. Um, 
Gambia, um, fortunately for us, uh, we have not experienced um, any civil war or carnage, um, apart from the impasse um, that created uh, for a very brief period, um, you know, uh, some, some, some people that were refugees um, in neighboring countries like Senegal and Guinea-Bissau to a lesser degree, um, but that didn't last long. Um, once Jame and Eko, once Jame was gone um, through the intervention of Ecomic, um, a lot of the Gambians that uh, that fled returned. Um, so that case really doesn't doesn't exist um, uh, in terms of um, 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 applicability, um, unlike other countries. Um, in terms of uh, the Swaziland elections, the Tinkunla system, in my opinion. Um, and that that's more than my opinion, just based on um, the Africa's shared values and African standards, falls way below, doesn't even um, come close um, to actually um, complying um, to the African standards and uh, governance values, um, whether it's um, the, uh, the AGDEG, whether it's um, the AUCPCC, whether it's um, even the EPRM to a certain degree, which is the primary governance mechanism, and certainly the Human Rights Charter, there's some major gaps um, as far as the government of um, Swaziland or Eswatini um, abiding by these. So for me, as far as I'm concerned, um, any semblance of an election um, is a mirage, um, and uh, it doesn't basically stand up to scrutiny. And if anything doesn't stand up to scrutiny at the very minimal level, um, then certainly you cannot uh, label it as an election. Um, it's something else, but it's not an election. Um, so <clears throat> I don't want to dwell further on that. Um, in terms of um, ensuring um, the election's integrity, I think there was a question around that. Um, I, I think for me, one of the main issues is again, and this is why this particular exercise is so important, um, you know, access to information on elections actually primarily encompasses a lot of things, but one of the fundamental things that it actually um, encompasses um, and actually tries to um, embrace and promote um, is basically the access um, to the voters list, um, not only to ensure that if you have registered to be a voter that you are captured, but to ensure that it is everybody else that is registered is properly captured, right? Um, in other words, to ensure that you're not padding um, the voters list um, for, you know, future um, rigging, um, because that's the, I mean, rigging in elections actually doesn't happen on election day. It happens way before elections day. Um, and usually it's about the padding um, of that voters list. Um, it's about ghost voters. Um, it's about basically getting people that are illegal, etc. to vote. So I think um, in terms of preventing that, um, access to information around the voters list is absolutely imperative. Um, as we move forward. Thanks. I see that Sarah's come back on camera. That tells me that um, my time is up. Thanks. Thank you so much again, and thank you so much for the participants for sending in your question. Quite an interesting discussion going on in the Q&A section, so feel free to share your questions, and thank you for your input, Jagan. Um, I think now we shall move on to the next and final presentation uh, by Lawrence M. Mote. Uh, Lawrence Murugi Mote is a human rights and governance consultant. He is a lecturer uh, at the Faculty of Law University of Nairobi and a member of the UN Trust Fund for Victims of Torture. Uh, most importantly, he was a former special rapporteur on freedom of expression and access to information in Africa and uh, the former vice chairperson of the Africa Commission on Human and People's Rights. I think it's also important to note that he was the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and access to information when the commission adopted these guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa. And he has been key in spearheading the preparation of the Declaration of Principles of Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa. And obviously uh, for the report on Kenya, we were very happy to have have him on board as a lead researcher because who best to uh, do the assessment more than the person who created the marking scheme. So Commissioner Mote, please feel free to uh, take over and provide your presentation for Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um... Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues, friends. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly, Commissioner. Excellent. Um, so let me start by 
uh, thanking each one of you for being part of this launch this morning or afternoon. Uh, I think I should acknowledge uh, every one of you, but also in particular, my senior uh, colleague and good friend, uh, Commissioner Tlakula, uh, if you're still um, in the session. Then what I shall do is um, provide an overview of uh, the report. Uh, which we prepared for Kenya. Obviously, uh, presenting a report, which is uh, you know around 150 pages in 15 minutes, it cannot be easy. So I'll just focus on a uh, highlight. So this report evaluates the realization of the right uh, of access to information uh, during the 2022 general election uh, here in Kenya. And the report is obviously based on the guidelines uh, on access to information and elections uh, in Africa. Um, I should speak to methodology. Um, what we decided to do was really prepare a qualitative uh, report. And so this report was based uh, on you know, secondary sources, a few primary sources also, um, I should also say that we did assessments and we had an assessment criteria. Uh, remember, we're speaking about, I think, around 18 guidelines, which were active guidelines for purposes of the assessment which was made. So we had an assessment criteria uh, where we measured uh, either that in respect of particular guidelines or sub guidelines, there was compliance. Uh, where there was about 75 percent in our assessment uh, of uh, compliance or mostly complied uh, between 50 and 75 percent um i know it's arguable uh, you know is that mostly complied or not then partly complied uh, 25 to 50 percent and not complied where our assessment was it was under under 25 percent now a couple of contextual comments just to place Kenya um, uh, within the electoral context. So we were assessing the 12th general election of the country uh, since independence. But significantly, this was the third general election under the 2010 constitution. So here we are speaking about the election which took place on 9 August 2022. Um, historically, Kenyan elections uh, had uh, been high stakes affairs, have been high stakes affairs, and quite often uh, they have triggered or fueled uh, the sorts of civil conflicts, which unfortunately at their most vicious were witnessed in the post-election violence. Uh, following the 2027, uh, 20, 2007 uh, general election. Um, this particular election, the one of last year, very closely contested, uh, principally between two political party formations, involved um, over 16,000 candidates vying for uh, seats in six elective positions. So from the presidency to the Senate, at uh, the National Assembly, to governors, uh, to members of parliament, and also to what we call MCAs, members of county assemblies. Now, in terms of the legal framework for access to information in Kenya, just to mention that, uh, yes, indeed, Kenya, we have this um, extremely um, you know, progressive revolutionary constitution. So actually, sometimes you wonder, that Kenyans only 10 years after adopting their constitution or just over that 13 years want to change it again, which I think is, is quite problematic. But so you look at Article 35 of the constitution and in there you have guarantees for every citizen of the right to access information, which is held by the state. You actually also have in that article uh, what really amounts to a proactive disclosure requirement. Uh, that the state shall publish and publicize any important information 
affecting the nation. And you have a number of other guarantees, again, under Article 35 of the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, for example, guaranteeing every citizen the right of access to information held by another person and required for the exercise or protection of any right or fundamental freedom. Finally, it establishes that every person has the right to the correction or deletion of untrue or misleading information that affects the person. And, and as you know, all these that I'm citing are actually important key principles uh, established either in the guidelines themselves or previously in the model law uh, for access to information and indeed the declaration uh, on principles of uh, freedom of expression and access to information. Uh, all these are instruments which were adopted by the SOFLO instruments adopted by the African Commission. We do have an Access to Information Act of 2016. Um, this is a comparative strong statute, I must say. Um, I think one study gave the Act a score of 75% when assessed against uh, the model law. So you can see, uh, in that sense, it's an excellent uh, uh, law. Uh, obviously, then you do have questions of uh, implementation. And I think actually that's all I want to say about the Access to Information uh, Act, because I could say much more, uh, but in terms of the uh, uh, time I have, um, you know, uh, perhaps just to say that one of the things which it does is actually establish a clear institutional framework uh, for purposes of um, overseeing implementation of the right to access information. So you have the Commission on Administrative Justice, um, which is given that role. And actually one of the commissioners of the Commission on Administrative Justice is actually designated as the Access to Information Commissioner. So I think, uh, you know, that's, that, that's important. Um, uh, you do have a whole lot of other relevant statutes, including the Data Protection Act, the Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act, which is quite controversial, uh, the Leadership and Integrity Act, which we usually uh, in Kenya respect by actually not respecting it. Uh, so again, that's quite problematic. So then moving forward to the actual assessments which we made, extent of compliance uh, with the guidelines, uh, as I said, um, we were looking at, uh, I would say, uh, 18, around 18 guidelines, um, focusing on sometimes extremely substantive issues, sometimes on more nuanced and you could almost say obscure issues. Um, so in terms of the process for the selection and appointment of members of electoral management bodies, and here we are really speaking about members of the IEBC, and we are also speaking about the appointment uh, process for the uh, registrar uh, of political parties. Um, the sorts of issues which we identified, uh, because you know, by and large, um, we, we, our assessment was that there was compliance. Unfortunately, uh, particularly around the recruitment of commissioners, once um, the relevant parliamentary committee advertises and then makes recommendations to the president, then the president is supposed to uh, pick uh, from the proposed names and then again send back now his proposals for appointment as commissioners to parliament for its approval. At that point, it becomes quite opaque. You're never quite sure how the president sifts the recommendations which are made by parliament, then for purposes of the president, then sending some names and not other names uh, to parliament. So we thought that is an, a, you know, a, a quite problematic um, issue. Of course, uh, you know, you could argue there's room for discretion, but even where there's room for discretion, uh, the public still needs to know because then others what was the point of public participation. Now, in terms of electoral management bodies uh, facilitating access to information on their operations, which is one of the requirements, I think, in guideline 13, so political parties uh, facilitating access to information on their operations, um, the, some of the issues which we identified and which we flagged on the basis of which we also made recommendations was the importance for the IEBC and the ORPP to create, keep, organize, and maintain their records in a manner 
that facilitates access to information. So what we're saying is that actually all these bodies have websites, hard websites, and commendably so with lots of information. But uh, you are never quite sure looking at all that information that actually it was properly denoted, it was properly uh, 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 set out uh, in a way that which was easy to access. And so, for example, one of the things which we specifically say is that dissemination platforms such as websites, uh, also social media, because all these institutions, IEBC, ORPP, use uh, social media, that they need to be accessible to uh, vulnerable and marginalized groups uh, and here, of course, I could cite persons with disabilities, but also one has to cite the countryside. You know, we speak social media and we are no longer printing documents because we think everyone can access websites, but actually the countryside, the rural countryside cannot because it's about, um, uh, you know, buying MBs and MBs can be quite expensive. Also, around operations, uh, the other issue uh, was the importance of adopting and implementing flexible, proactive disclosure arrangements that enable access to information without the need for individual applications. Now, uh, in, a, in, in particular, we took note of one section in the Independent in the Electoral and Borders Commission Act, which needs to be aligned with Section 5 of the uh, access to Information Act, which again, as I said, is a relatively good law, the Access to Information Act. But actually, when you look at the Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission Act, it actually sort of pushes back on um, what is broadly set out in the Access to Information Act um, in terms of the list of information which public entities should disclose proactively. So it's important that then that gets uh, looked at. Now, in terms of uh, electoral management bodies um, and their requirement to publish uh, every year accurate and updated information, uh, we did again note that this does happen, or at least information is published. As to whether it is actually published every year on an annual basis, that is not the case. And so this uh, is something which uh, you know the IEBC and the ORPP need again to uh, to, to 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 look at. Now, um, one of the um, areas of assessment under Guideline 17 is in respect of the IEBC proactively disclosing certain information during the pre-election uh, period, and here we found that uh, there was uh, you know, instances of partial compliance. There were instances of complete non-compliance. And so some of the issues which were identified, uh, for example, in respect of the ORPP, the Register of Political Parties, the need for the ORPP to provide details of applications made by political parties for registration as participants in the electoral process. Now, point here is, when you looked at the website of the ORPP, you did find the final list of political parties uh, which would could uh, participate in the election. But you never easily found uh, information on the number of applications made, the number of applications granted, the number denied, and reasons for each denial. So this, again, needs to be information which is put out there on the face of the record. Again, IBC, the importance for IBC to provide information on a whole host of issues. For example, the storage and security of the ballot boxes of diaspora voters. So it's commendable that in Kenya, and actually quite explicitly, the IBC did advertise this often, that uh, Kenyans in the diaspora in over 10 countries could actually go and vote um, in the polls, or, or only for the presidency, but they could vote. But in terms of the mechanics, the storage and security of the ballot boxes of diaspora voters, that information was not really available. So then they would be stored properly until the general count uh, was happening. Also, 
uh, the importance of providing a, a proactive and explicit information on the criteria for identification of the location of voting stations. Now, you may think this is uh, mundane uh, because you might think it's obvious that uh, you know voting stations happen, happen in, in schools. But if, for example, you take uh, perspectives of you are a pastoralist, you're moving from one place to another place, or indeed, or you have a disab disability. So you're asking, why did you bring this polling station in a school which is not accessible? And so the IBC needed to you know, provide that information in terms of uh, the criteria which they use when they cite uh, polling stations. Um, IBC, again, needed to provide information on how it addressed all complaints or petitions throughout an electoral cycle. So what tended to happen was that from time to time you'd hear that complaints or petitions had been raised. If you wanted to trace the progression from the point of complaint to the point of finalization, you not uh, were not necessarily able to uh, you know, get that information. Now, um, I'll just move quickly uh, to the IBC and proactive disclosure around polling day. And um, now in respect of this, some of the issues which arose, uh, and I should stress that there's lots of context which actually is established in the report itself, which you'd have to look at, um, is the importance for the IABC to ensure that it continues to provide information on vote counts at the um, uh, uh, voting stations or at the counting, at the tallying centers until the final results are announced. Uh, those who recall the Kenyan situation um, will know that the IEBC at some point uh, in the National Tallying Center, uh, you know, stopped uh, broadcasting the tally, uh, or, and, and that that raised its own, uh, you know, particular problem. So it, it's important that uh, there's transparency, there's accountability from the beginning of the counting to the very end uh, of the announcement of the result, and so that's why we make this recommendation. We also say that IEBC needs to provide full information on all complaints or petitions received and how, again, those have been addressed. And um, now, then, uh, yes, I hear Sarah, time is up. Um, I think just to mention uh, uh, two things in respect of uh, our political parties, uh, to say that um, around political parties, and uh, uh, candidacies um, for political parties, one of the issues which we noted was that uh, political parties did not proactively uh, provide information on the number of their registered uh, members. So again, this is a recommendation which we are making that uh, political parties need to do better as far as that is concerned. Um, Finally, I think I'll skip most of this and just uh, say that uh, we made assessments in respect of media, we made assessments in respect of uh, electoral observers, and also in respect of civil society organizations which work on issues of elections. And in respect of civil society organizations, what we noted was that uh, although many of them were focused on issues of accountability and transparency, some of them did not necessarily follow the guidelines, which required them also to indicate, for example, who are funding them, to indicate, uh, you know, who are their key uh, members, who are their key officials. And uh, Sarah, I think just to complete and say, one particularly commendable thing that happened in Kenya uh, at the election was the fact that the internet was shut, was not shut down. Now that's that's significant because it's something which we saw happening a lot around Africa. And so the fact that the internet was not shut, I think is commendable and a good practice which we, we should commend for the rest of Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for your input and insights uh, on elections in Kenya. I know this was um, quite an interesting uh, journey for us as Kenyans. And obviously we had some questions uh, which are general, not necessarily directed to your presentation on Kenya. And I am hoping you will be able to address some of them. Uh, the first question is from our partners in DRC, 
who are asking, how do we ensure the protection of journalists and dissenting, vo dissenting political voices uh, to protect access to information during elections? So I'm guessing we could borrow from Kenya or your knowledge uh, on this. Uh, the second question is, how do we ensure that laws governing political party funding from private stakeholders are not used against civil society and movements? And lastly is how do we ensure access to information for persons with disabilities, IDPs and those in detention centers is guaranteed during elections? Um, I think we can start with these three. And uh, if anyone else has any questions, I think after uh, commissioner finishes on this, we'll allow some oral inputs from participants so you can start raising your hands. Thank you. Uh, please proceed, commissioner. So on the question of the, on the question of funding, the question of funding, first, just to provide the the Kenya context, which is that um, one of the difficulties with the last year's election was the fact that uh, the um, the campaign financing um, act, which uh, would have uh, enabled us to as Kenyans. Uh, you know, to know who was contributing what amounts of money to who, uh, while it had been enacted, it did not have regulations. And so that actually was quite uh, problematic. It meant that, for example, we did not know or we could not, you know, uh, seek and query um, who was giving money to who and to what extent, uh, how much each campaign was spending on, uh, um, on, 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 on elections and all that. Now, um, I think that it's always a concern that um, financing to political parties or to campaigns might prejudice uh, others, uh, as the questioner asks, including uh, you know people who are in civil society. I think my approach to this would be to say that we would not then say that there should not be financing because two wrongs don't make a right. I think the question would be, um, how do we then ensure that any uh, financing uh, which is given to political parties is not misused? So I think that would be the approach. So it's not about saying, let's talk. Uh, it's about saying, how do we ensure that we put in place the, you know, adequate regulations uh, for purposes of ensuring that uh, you know, that sort of financing is not uh, misused. Now, on the question of safety of journalists, uh, even when I was a reporter, that always used to be a, a great concern um, that we needed to ensure uh, the safety of journalists around the continent and uh, over time, I think we had extremely many journalists, uh, you know, who got either killed or injured, you know, whether it was in Somalia or indeed other countries. And so um, I think the way to go is to make sure that uh, journalists have voice. It is to make sure that when incidents happen, then uh, they are reported and then people also are brought to a book. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the highlights uh, in our report um, was about an incident which happened where I think it was um, uh, Azimio or ODM um, roughed up certain journalists uh, last year around the elections, before the elections. And there were huge complaints. The journalist union uh, complained uh, you know, vigorously and actually ODM uh, apologized on the record. And so um, I think there needs to be a, a lot more of that. And I know that as I say this, some of that may be easier in some countries than others. I know, for example, that might be a little more difficult in Uganda um, than, for example, in, 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 in Kenya. And then finally, on the question of the um, uh, persons with disabilities, I think um, this is a quite difficult uh, issue. Because it's about many things. It's about stigma. It's about prejudice. Uh, it's about uh, the extent to which um, accessibility, um, uh, polling stations are accessible. 
uh, the extent to which um, um, voting material is, uh, is set out there in accessible formats. And um, um, I think it's, 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 it's work in progress. Uh, in Kenya, we do not have um, um, material uh, which is in accessible format. So what the law or, or in alternatively has done is to uh, put in place, for example, uh, formulas under which there can be assisted voting. So I think it's a mix of things. And it's extremely important that whatever you do in your countries, you ensure that you are involving uh, uh, people with disabilities themselves because they're the ones then who would be able to suggest um, uh, uh, ways of uh, ensuring that uh, they are able to, uh, you know, to vote effectively. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for your input and also for answering those questions. And I think now I will briefly uh, take up any questions or any oral input or reactions from the participants. Uh, initially, we had hands from Cine Grod and Miguel Gomez Antonio. I don't know if they still want to speak, but as they do that, I think I will... Um, I saw Kweti, do you still want to speak? Okay, as we wait for, uh, okay, Roland, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and um, provide your input. Kweti? Okay, as we figure that out, um, I think then I will start issuing questions to uh, some of the pending questions uh, to our presenters. And obviously I will start with the question on Ghana from Hamidou. Uh, why in Ghana, there are certain problems between members of the political system concerning elections during the Jean Kofor period. So I'm guessing he is asking for um, cl clarification on uh, members of the political system during the Ghanaian elections. Uh, there's also a question on proactive disclosure of election data or information. Um, this is also for Ghana. What does the EMB, what, in what ways does the EMB proactively disclose electoral data or information, including voter roll, audit reports, electoral results, and procurement of electoral information? Uh, that's a question also for Ghana. Uh, another question for Uganda. In Uganda, can the Electoral Commission of Uganda use its constitutional mandate to proactively access information aimed at resolving conflict of interest between the state and the society? So um, I'm guessing that uh, Daniel will be able to answer that question for Uganda. Uh, for Kenya, uh, this is Gitahi Githuku, and it's a question for Commissioner Mute. Did the matter on misuse of state resources come up in Kenya? Did the matter of misuse of state resources come up in Kenya? And uh, the last question, I think it's from Kweti. Uh, he was not able to speak, so I'm guessing he typed it down. Uh, during campaigns, politicians here and I believe elsewhere, make use of not only government personnel like drivers and bodyguards, uh, but of material cars and infrastructure like buildings and grounds. Even if funding sources were to be reported, can anyone estimate expenses associated with the use of the mentioned resources? So I'm guessing this question uh, is similar to the previous question on misuse of state resources by politicians. Um, I'll ask once more if there's anyone from the audience who wants to provide any oral input. Okay, uh, if not, I will allow, okay, Crispin Bosiri, please um, feel free to unmute yourself. Crispin Bosiri. Shamano, are you able to help with that? I don't know if there's something with their microphones or their audio, but as you handle that, I think we can start with Michael on the question for Ghana as also you finalize your remarks. Michael, please go ahead. 
Yeah. Um. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah, for uh, the questions. I'm not quite sure I understand the first question with regards to the problems between the national system. During in terms of the second question on proactive disclosure by the electoral management body, um, generally when it comes to things like um, information regarding the voters' role, that would usually be available on the the website of the electoral commission. Uh, it's also available at the the district offices of 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 the the commission. Um, which is open and accessible to, to the public. Uh, information regarding um, actual, what do you call it, uh, election results, that is dependent on the nature of the e elections. Uh, but generally, the election results are declared at the polling station publicly. Uh, and it, it, a record of the information is, is, is then uh, posted on the notice board at that particular polling station so that members of the public have access to, to that kind of in information. But also the, the, a copy of the electoral results is given to political party representatives or if it's an independent candidate contesting for either parliamentary or presidential election. A copy of the results itself is given uh, to, to the representatives of, of those candidates. Uh, the kind of information that is generally not available publicly and which sometimes is not even available upon request is information relating to procurement. And as I indicated in my presentation, there has been instances where people have had to go to court to actually get courts to compel the electoral commission to release uh, information uh, on, on on procurement of uh, electoral materials and, and, and other other kinds of resources but I suppose it's as a general kind of um situation with a lot of state institutions uh, in Ghana and across many parts of Africa where if you like sensitive uh, finance related information generally is not made available for obvious reasons. Of course, the excuse that is generally given is the confidentiality of the third, uh, third party private uh, individuals or uh, organizations. But in the most instances, these are deeply hidden to dis not disclose information that the public might find problematic. Uh, procurement breaches, uh, you know, value for money uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, concerns on whether or not the, the amount of money that is spent is actually worth the, the, the value that the public is, is getting for those kind of, of materials and resources. But yeah, that is, is still a challenge with regards to the, the commission does not make this information proactively uh, yeah. available to the public and people have to request uh, for, for, for this information. And I think it is one of our recommendations that the commission has in its own internal processes, guidelines on what information it will make proactively available to the public and the nature of information that the public would have to justify uh, the, the, the need on, on a need to basis. Yeah. Now, those are my, my, my comments on the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I think now I will uh, request Crispin Bosire to uh, provide their input. Crispin, if you're still uh, open to the oral intervention, please proceed. Thank you very much. And uh, good to hear from uh, Commissioner and Part of the problems that were faced were the quality of information that the public were able to access, specifically on the ORPP, the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties portal, which was set up after complaints on misuse of personal data. So the question is, to what extent did the quality of information affect decision making. Uh, considering that people had already been registered in political parties that they did not sign up for, and part of accessing that information through the public portal required use of internet and the remote areas and far-flung areas that they, they, they were not able to access internet or to be able to access the register of political parties portal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crispin. Uh, I think that's a question, a build up to your question to Commissioner Mute. Um, I will ask it later on, but Nkweti Ronda, Ronald, Roland, sorry, uh, please feel free to provide your input. Hey, uh, thanks very much, Sana. Thank you. I'm very happy being part of this launch. 
And uh, just to inform us of a, a very a way uh, to go around the obstacles of that um, uh, dictators always put around the corners say, to prevent the smooth uh, sentiment of information. A while ago, I wrote in a, a Q&A uh, session about the PVC. PVC is a parallel vote counting uh, a project which gives uh, the that possibility to be a journalist, not just a voter, but a reporter. They take pictures and videos of all what is happening at the polling station in uh, which are channeled to, to into a database. When this is done, information can no longer, that's information dissemination can no longer be a problem, but it can just be delayed. But once I'm saying this in a situation where maybe internet is uh, suspended, but once internet is restored, I think pictures and videos taken uh, within our smartphones and other uh, information and communication gadgets remain with us that can always be uh, distributed. So this was what was done with a project that uh, we carried out in 2018 during the uh, last presidential elections in Cameroon. Um, and then I want to deplore the uh, situation, the case where uh, that's the fact that uh, the Center for Human Rights of uh, the, uh, the University of Pretoria is not is not present. It's not really present in uh, much, most French-speaking countries where electoral uh, 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 problems or malpractices are at the at the or at the order of the day. I wish to plead uh, that if uh, the center would be more present in Francophone Africa, I think it would be uh, much more laudable. We are seeing the, the number of schools are uncountable, and most of them recently in French speaking Africa. I think uh, the Center for Human Rights of the University of Pretoria should endeavor to be much to be more present within uh, the, the, the French speaking uh, African countries because we keep talking about freedom of information in Africa. We are not talking of freedom of information only in Ghana, only in Gambia, not only in the Uganda, Zimbabwe, or uh, or in Kenya. We're talking about Africa in general. So please, we would like to welcome you guys to uh, within the French speaking African countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input in Kwaiti. And just to reiterate, he is sharing uh, his experience in mitigating internet shutdowns during elections. And he shared their project of creating a media repository for media and audiovisual coverage during elections in the event of a shutdown, so that when uh, the internet is reinstated, you are able to still access this information. And I believe he is sharing his insights from Cameroon and is also called upon uh, the center and all of our stakeholders to also make sure we extend this level of support on providing access to information in Francophone countries as well, in African Francophone countries, so that this is felt all through the continent. And so in the interest of time, I think we'll only take those two questions, or rather those two insights, and then I will go back to my panelists, uh, first of all, in Uganda, and uh, just reiterate the question by Anthony. Can the Electoral Commission of Uganda use its constitutional mandate to proactively access public information aimed at resolving conflicts of interest between state and society. Uh, Daniel, if you're able to answer that, please. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, once again, uh, I like I had said earlier, that I think the constitutional mandate does exist, and it is possible for the Electoral Commission to do so. Um, I think the, the bigger challenge would probably be the perception, the perception from, um, uh, either opposition or other parties as to whether um, this right is being uh, exercised judiciously uh, or not. Uh, but otherwise, the, the enabling laws do give um, the Electoral Commission at least those powers to even preliminary check and including disqualified candidates who do not uh, fit the bill. Thank you very much much thank you so much daniel and i think the last 
a set of questions uh, for Commissioner uh, Lawrence Mute, and it's on the matter of misuse of state resources uh, in the elections in Kenya, as well as the quality of information from the ORPP portal, and to what extent did the quality of this information impact Kenya's assessment on proactive disclosure of information and elections. Commissioner? Starting with the question on quality, it's actually, in fact, uh, the information which was provided uh, on the portal of the uh, 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 RPP, ORPP, actually quite coincidentally, showed the power of information. Now, Kenyans might recall, and perhaps Bosire, that as you said, that uh, suddenly, on the basis of information provided to the public by the ORPP, Kenyans began realizing that they were included in political parties which they had never joined. So that in itself was extremely powerful. Now, what happened then was you anticipated as Kenyans that the other relevant office, the Data Protection uh, Commissioner, would then have stepped in with appropriate remedies. And I think what is interesting and which again we capture in the report is the fact that uh, unfortunately all the necessary uh, protocols uh, were not in place for purposes of enabling um, you know, Kenyans who were wrongly um, said to be members of political, political parties um, so that then that they would get a remedy. So I think the point there is, yes, indeed, you could look at the question of quality. And uh, it's true that uh, all the information that one needed was not always there and that information, even when it was there, sometimes was not you know, detailed. But again, you saw the power or the potential of information when actually it is put out there um, to the public. Uh, as far as the question of resources is concerned, the answer is yes. Uh, was there misuse of state resources? The answer is yes. As I pointed out at, at the beginning, we had this very strange situation where you had these two a big party formations which were contesting the election. And actually all the two party formations had access to government because on one side, you had the president, therefore meaning government, uh, supporting the opposition uh, candidate. And uh, then you also had uh, uh, the vice president um, who again had his formation. And so in that sense, again, he was in government. So actually what you had were these two party formations uh, complaining that uh, each other were misusing uh, state resources. And actually on the record, um, you know, it, it was clear that there was misuse of, uh, of, of, of resources. I think part of the difficulty which we have uh, around uh, access to information, for example, is that uh, any cases which were instituted uh, around misuse of state resources were not necessarily uh, prosecuted to the very end. And for example, one of the things that happened after the election was that uh, the director of public prosecution indeed withdrew some of the cases which then could have sort of uh, uh, shown up um, uh, for the sort of um, um, illegalities which happened around the election. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And I think uh, last question from our presenters is Jagan, and I'm just bringing you back to access to information for internally displaced persons and those in detention centers. How do we ensure they are, they are able to access this information, particularly during electoral processes? Thank you, Jagan. Um. I think um, certainly um, different countries, I'd imagine, have got um, different um, different laws um, around um, you know people under custody in some instances. Um, so if you're looking at prisoners, 
Um, I think certainly um, for the Gambia's case, um, being able to access to information on anything um, around the prison conditions, um, it's virtually non-existent. Um, in terms of, again, um, and I speak for Gambia's case, um, the Disability Act um, still needs to be, um, to be uh, rolled out and, and deployed fully. Um, I know that there have been calls um, for reforms to have taken place um, around that, um, but I think certainly um, a lot more work needs to be done um, in order to basically push those things through. But let me say one thing very quickly on the abuse of state resources, um, and, and I call them that. It's not necessarily the misuse because it's, there's a direct intention um, to use public resources to at least cure um, political advantage um, and ensure that you get a certain result moving forward. Um, I think the guidelines very clearly speak to the ASR issue. But I think that abuse of state resources, the ASR issue, I think it's something that needs to be elevated and prioritized as we move forward, not only in terms of this particular report and this exercise, but I think more importantly, um, just around our entire governance and, uh, and, and our sound democratic practice um, aspirations. Um, abuse of state resources has been responsible largely um, to a lot of the things that we're beginning to see now um, in terms of, again, even civil, civil unrest, um, challenges to, of results, and also even um, political um, upheaval um, on the continent. So I think, I think it's good that our audience um, are mindful to that, um, but I think the Center for Human Rights together with the African Commission needs to go further um, to see how we can stem um, this particular practice, which is prevalent um, almost in every state in varying degrees. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jagan, Michael, Daniel, and Lawrence for your input, your research, and uh, your tremendous participation and involvement in uh, making this uh, event and these uh, reports come to fruition. Uh, we also thank you, uh, your participants, for your input and the questions we've been able to receive in this session. Joyce Kihara, your comments are well acknowledged, and we thank you for your feedback. And so without further ado, please allow me to hand over uh, the uh, agenda back to uh, my colleague, Lingyue, so that we can move on to the next session on the launch of the reports. Once more, thank you so much to the researchers for your inputs. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Sarah, for the excellent uh, moderation of, of the session. And we got um, input uh, on the different uh, contexts um, in, in the Gambia, in, in Uganda, in, in Kenya, and also um in in Ghana on uh, on on access to information and um and elections and thank you so much once again for the excellent uh, contribution from our, our researchers who managed to put to together the reports so now we uh, i see i'm not seeing the commissioner on the on the on the call to to launch the the reports um is that so sarah i'm not seeing commissioner topsy yeah, I think okay. Sure. Um, Lloyd, are you present to just launch the reports in one or two minutes? I, I think you are. Yes, I'm, I'm here. I okay. was seeing yep. the commissioner, and uh, I think she was driving. And uh, yes. I think uh, the last few minutes, she seemed to to have disappeared. Okay, yeah. maybe just give us a few remarks, two minutes, and uh, officially launch the the reports, and, and then we proceed. Okay. Um. Firstly, thank you so much to the um excellent reports. Um. Very comprehensive. Uh, covered a lot of aspects. Um. And I think um there are many good lessons there. There are best practices. There are also some of those best things that we need to move away from. Um, and I, we can, well, I would, I don't want to promise, but we are hoping, um, as uh, raised by Nkwerti Roland there, that we'll move to Francophone Africa as well. 
um, particularly Cameroon itself, I mean, and, and other Francophone, uh, you know, region, can, countries of, of, of the continent, um, I think it would be, we would take the challenge uh, as a center and our partners, uh, I think, to move over to, to the Francophone region as well and uh, do similar research and, and launch reports just to um, also um, focus on what's happening in that part of our continent. Uh, I think it's critical. We cannot leave out uh, those regions as well. Um, but just to congratulate uh, the, all the, res the four researchers, um, truly these resp reports were expertly written. And um, I think they are going to be useful as we move forward in improving um, our elections. I mean, of course, there were a number of issues that were raised, including the issue of uh, internet shutdowns, the use of state resources, um, access to information on the websites of the electoral management bodies, the um, challenge of um, that, that, is, that is faced by, by journalists when they report and try to you know, contribute to facilitating access to information. Um, and also, I think uh, the um, role of um, technology uh, in, in facilitating access to information. So quite a lot of issues that, that have been raised. Um, and I just want to congratulate really again the researchers for a job well done. Uh, on that note, um, I then want to officially on behalf of the center and our partners at U19, both of them, um, um, want to launch the four reports on, uh, I mean, I think West Africa and East Africa, Ghana, Gambia, Kenya, and Uganda. Um, and of course, we'll be looking forward to the Zimbabwe report uh, very soon. Um, and after that, we'll move to Francophone Africa. So I hereby launch those four reports and um, hope that uh, they are going to be utilized by academia, by practitioners, by the commission itself, and other African human rights bodies, including uh, uh, you know the Pan-African Parliament, I'm, and I'm looking at Jagan there, I hope the Pan-African Parliament and the members thereof are going to utilize uh, these reports. So thank you so much, uh, moderator, over to you. The reports are officially launched. Thank you so much, um, Lloyd, for, for that. So the, the reports will be available on the platforms of the Center for Human Rights and also um, the Article 19 platforms as well. Feel free, feel free to, to use them um, for advocacy purposes. Feel free also to criticize us. We uh, welcome constructive uh, criticism as well. We would like to, to improve. If you look at our first report on South Africa and if you look at Kenya and the Gambia, and, uh, you will see that there is a significant difference as well. We have kind of improved on uh, our approach to, to the assessment. We are not only looking at the guidelines, but we are also incorporating the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression. So, uh, for example, if you are looking at the issue of um, um, information being uh, proactively disclosed. How about, uh, you know, all this uh, information disorder that characterizes the information landscape on the continent as well? What do we do about that in the in the context of elections? And also we saw the use of um, um, uh, technology in, in, in Nigeria. And then there's also the question of if the information is available on websites and all these digital platforms, how about those that are geographically isolated, that those that are not uh, um, are effectively uh, connected as well. How do they access that information? So we try also to bring in those dynamics into, into this assessment. So the latest um, election that we had on the continent, quite traumatic, was the election in, in Zimbabwe. And every time, you know, the events unfolded on the Zimbabwean elections, you're just wondering, did that, did that happen? You know, how is that even possible? So um, for me, I, I think the most um, shocking of the things was, you know, the word that was being thrown around by the opposition of um, um, strategic ambiguity. And I was quite perplexed that uh, a, a party that called itself a government in, in waiting 
um, is not ready to proactively disclose information. Yet when it happens that they are in government, we expect them to be uh, transparent. So that was a bit shocking for me. And, uh, you know, there were also other uh, developments. There was a lot of, you know, requests around the voters' role being released. That was another story. But um, we are in the process of finalizing the report on, on the Zimbabwean elections, which I, I, I hope is going to be a very interesting report based on the dynamics that we saw happening in Zimbabwe. I, not, I don't know if you've heard of a situation where polling station has received uh, ballot papers at 5 p.m. or it's 3 p.m. And, and things like that and people using their uh to phone torches to look for their for their for their names and and all that it, it was quite dramatic but now we are going to call upon admire to just give us a glimpse of uh you know what happened in zimbabwe in the context of this conversation that we are having today um admire is a is a media a professional um, he is currently uh, a professor of, of media at the um, University of the Johannesburg, and he is also the researcher for the Zimbabwean assessment, which is ongoing now. He's finalizing the report on Zimbabwe, but we just thought of giving him an opportunity to just give us snippets of some of the findings of, of uh, you know, that assessment in Zimbabwe. Admire, over to you. Hi, uh, Shengu, how are you doing? Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let me just try and uh, share my s a few slides that I have here. I want to see if I can get the slides. Oh, yes. I hope you can see my slides now. Can you? Yes, we can see the slide. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And also, thanks a lot for uh, the people that are on this call. Thank you so much for those that have already uh, finalized their reports. And uh, congratulations to those uh, whose reports have already been also launched uh, on this platform. Thank you so much. And I think Zimbabwe is uh, thing you were saying is it always. Uh, introduces uh, interesting dynamics uh, to this subject of proactive uh, disclosure of uh, information during elections, uh, notwithstanding, obviously, the, the other challenges that obviously have got political and economic uh, dimensions. But of course, information, the information space or the information landscape is always a battleground where uh, various uh, political uh, players and also uh, other stakeholders also try as much as possible to, 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 to compete and also to outmaneuver each other on these particular platforms. So certainly the, the issue of uh, disclosure of information becomes very important, not only uh, because uh, of how it enables our citizens actually to undertake their uh, roles as uh, informed uh, citizens, but also in the way in which information is the currency in which, uh, through which democracy uh, actually uh, uh, flowers, but also uh, leaves. So it's very important for us, obviously, to reflect uh, uh, primarily in terms of what actually happens. I think let me start by giving you the context uh, in terms of these elections before I probably give you some uh, preliminaries in terms of what happened. Uh, certainly, these elections uh, were very important in many in many instances because they were coming in, a, in, in the context of uh, the military-assisted uh, uh, takeover that happened in November 2017 which uh, obviously then led to an election uh, in July uh, of 20, 2018. And with that, we have had uh, the, 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 the latest or the so-called Second Republic, uh, which is under the leadership of um, uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, actually taking the reins as from uh, August uh, uh, 20, 2018 until uh, the recently, obviously, when they were are declared as winners of the recent elections. But there are so many things that have happened in the last five years that obviously shaped uh, the ways in which uh, this particular election actually played itself out. And also how this proactive uh, disclosure of information was somehow 
affected but also influenced uh, both positively but also negatively uh, as a result. I just want to flag the issue of the what I would probably call the authoritarian uh, kind of consolidation that we have seen uh, in the last five years and how that is also shaped uh, the way in which information flows have actually been uh, witnessed during but also post-election. But also what has also happened uh, during this five, five, past five years has been also the decimation, decimation and cooptation of the, the, the opposition. So, for example, you would see the way in which uh, the then MDC alliance was strategically decimated, but also other members, of course, uh, were co-opted into the so-called uh, Pollard uh, 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 structure. Uh, by the ruling elite, and eventually that also led to the death of that particular uh, you know, out, uh, outfit called the MDCT under the leadership of uh, uh, Douglas Monzora. But over and above that, we've also seen in the last uh, five years again, there have been what I call calibrated media reforms that have been attempted by this particular regime. For example, we used to have uh, one of the most draconian laws called the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act called AIPA, uh, directly called AIPA. But uh, that particular act was somehow uh, uh, reformed and amended and we Come up, we came up with a new, uh, so-called new, but also new, new uh, in courts, uh, Freedom of Information Act. But also what we've also seen was the licensing of commercial and community television and radio stations. But if you look at who actually got the licenses, obviously most of the people that got licenses, they are either politically and economically uh, connected elites that are connected to the ruling elite. And most of them actually got uh, our licenses and actually running some of these uh, commercial uh, television, but also commercial radio uh, licenses that are already in operation. But also, we have also seen what uh, I would also call strategic legal reforms that have also shaped uh, the way in which these elections were also uh, happening. So, for example, you can talk about the amendment number one, whereby the, 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 the ruling elite or uh, the ruling parties, and PF actually uh, was able to, because of its two thirds majority in the previous elections, were able to pass a law that allowed the president, but also that allowed the, the parliament actually to change uh, the, the, the number of years that a, a, a sitting uh, uh, Chief Justice could actually be able to 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 to, to be uh, the, the number of the the, the the retirement age actually of the the, the, the Chief Chief Justice, which meant that uh, people like um, uh, just Chief Justice uh, Malava was able to continue as the the Chief Justice. Uh, beyond the, the required age limit by the constitution. And again, that also was one of the ways in which this authoritarian consolidation actually took place. But also over and above that, the elections were also happening in the context of the so-called uh, PVO bill, which is pretty much an NGO uh, bill, which is meant to uh, to curtail the operations, but also to, 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 to scuttle the operations of uh, NGOs in the country. But also, there was also the patriotic bill that also is just waiting presidential accent. I think right now it should have been uh, signed into law uh, by the president. Again, that also was also another very uh, unfortunate law that was actually passed on the eve of these uh, recent elections. But uh, on the other end, or on the uh, positive end, there was also the, 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 the passage of uh, the Data Protection Act of, uh, uh, initially it was called the Cyber and Data Protection Act, and later on it was actually then uh, revised to uh, Data and Protection Act of December 2021, but again, the, the, the amendment actually happened in March 2022. And that, again, has got uh, certain kinds of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sections where, of course, issues to do with uh, the spreading of misinformation uh, can also become uh, something that is uh, criminalized. So, again, this particular election was also happening in a context where already in the previous election, which is the 2018 election, we had already began to see a systematic use or a weaponization of disinformation and propaganda campaigns, especially online platforms like, for example, your Twitter, your, your Facebook, but also your WhatsApp. So again, that was the context in which uh, this particular election actually took place. But over and above that, there was also some strategic uh, judiciary capture. So for example, right now we've got people like um, Job Sikala still in, in pre-incarceration uh, detention, uh, almost one year plus uh, in jail. We have people like uh, Ngaru Vume jailed for uh, you know, various kinds of uh, you know, criminal nuisance uh, 
law, you know, cases that uh, have been also used uh, in that particular context. But over and above that, there were also factional politics playing itself out in both the ruling, but also the opposition political party. And that also was the, the, the precursor to this uh, August uh, election that we, we, we witnessed. But on a, on a very serious note, there was also something that also happened. Uh, because remember, every 10 years, uh, uh, Zimbabwe is supposed to do what is called the delimitation uh, exercise where, for example, you, re you change uh, the constituents' boundaries. So this was actually done uh, last year, but of course the report was, was actually handed over to the president sometime in February uh, 2023. And that, uh, with that delimitation exercise, these, these, uh, you know, people actually believed that there was a lot of gerrymandering that was actually happening. So most of the constituents that ended up actually being created by this delimit delimitation exercise was to the effect that uh, most of the constituents ended up actually uh, Actually, you know, we ended up actually seeing a lot of constituencies actually uh, in, you know, in the ruling party opposition, ruling party, uh, uh, you know, you know, strongholds are so mostly in rural areas or peri-urban areas. That's when you saw a lot of new uh, constituencies actually being uh, created, and as a result, some of the so-called strong uh, strongholds for the opposition that tends to be in urban areas actually lost a number of uh, constituencies uh, because of this delimitation exercise. But over and above that, I think um, I'm, I'm about to finish this um, this particular slide. Just to say that also the issue of the digital divide and inequality continues to, 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 to permeate even the use of these technologies. So if you talk about the internet, if you talk about the social media platforms in Zimbabwe, of course, people do, talk, do use a lot of WhatsApp, uh, especially the ordinary person. But Twitter tends to be very elitist because that's where most of the people that are in the intelligentsia, but the so-called middle class also uh, find themselves there, but also people that tends to live uh, in the diaspora tends to, uh, to, to use a lot of uh, those kinds of platforms. So even in the, if, even if uh, most of uh, the, 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 the communication that was actually being done by, for example, ZEC, uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission was happening on Twitter. Most of it actually was speaking to the people that are already converted, and therefore the, 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 the people that actually needed that kind of information were somehow being left out of this kind of uh, uh, platform. So it is in that particular context in which uh, I'm trying to paint that this particular election of the August 23, 2023 actually took place. For me, what is also very important before probably I just give you a few snippets in terms of what we have seen, is just to say that it was also the third election that actually happened under the 2013 uh, constitu constitution. Uh, it, was, it was the third, but also it was the second election after the removal of Robert Mugabe and also the death of uh, Morgan Shangri, which meant it was the second time that we're seeing two different kinds of faces actually being uh, uh, on the presidential ballots here, we're talking about Emerson Mnangagwa and also uh, Nelson Chamisa. But over, over and above that, there was also, in this particular election, we saw, because of I talked about the decimation of the opposition, we saw the emergence of a newly uh, rebranded, uh, but also new, new, some would probably call it a new party uh, rebranded, uh, which was somehow a splint of the MDC uh, alliance, which actually then emerged and called itself the citizens coalition for change under the leadership of Nelson Chamisa. So it was in this particular context that uh, this particular election happened. And obviously, uh, as part of one of their, their, their claims, uh, the, 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 the Triple C were of the opinion that because they are operating in what, in what they call an authoritarian regime, authoritarian uh, space, they had to use what they called their strategic ambiguity, which meant uh, you know, a carefully uh, uh, you know, approach where you throttle the information flow so that you don't give away a lot uh, to your opponent. And that actually then also affected the way in which they were able to proactively give information. And I think when we talk, when I talk about, for example, the, the, the release of the, 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 the names of the people that were going to represent the triple C, we actually see that strategic ambiguity actually uh, coming into, 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 into operation. But over and above that, as I've already pointed out, the use of the law also, we, we have also seen a lot of uh, legal challenges uh, just before this election. For example, you know, one uh, major uh, legal challenge was the one that was mounted by Sevia Kasukwere, who was once a member of the ZANU-PF, but now obviously, you know, is what he was 
is now an independent presidential candidate, but also people like Douglas Munzora of the MDCT also had also legal challenges where they were actually challenging the, 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 the legality of uh, the delimitation uh, uh, report that uh, ZEC actually, uh, you know, you know, you know uh, pre presented to the president in February 2023. Again, there was also so a legal challenge by another female uh, presidential candidate in the, by the name uh, Elizabeth Valerio, who was also uh, arguing that the, she was supposed to remain on the ballot uh, despite claims by Zek and other people that she actually was able to post a deposit of uh, nomination fees of 20,000 US dollars uh, just before uh, the, cut of dead, uh, the cut of time. And also we had also people like Linda Masarira unfortunately failed to win a case, but also she also had a similar kind of case. And also, of course, the other one, which was also very much covered by the mainstream, but also international media, was the case of the Blawayo Triple C 12, uh, whereby uh, 12 uh, candidates who were supposed to, to stand in uh, as candidates, uh, a member of, member of parliament candidates for Triple, uh, Triple C were actually told that they were not going to be on the ballot because they also filed their papers outside of the cut of date, uh, uh, cut, cut of time. But the other issue that is also very worrying for me, even as I speak about these things, was the issue that Zek, in its announcements of the nomination fees, actually set up the nomination fees for you to become a president. You were supposed to deposit uh, at least. 20,000 US dollars in a country which is actually going through a lot of economic challenges. This was also seen as a way of actually, uh, you know, making politics uh, become an elite sport. And as, as, as actually some people actually argue. And then uh, members of parliament were supposed to just uh, uh, deposit at least 2,000 uh, uh, US dollars. And again, this is a lot of money considering the context in which uh, this is actually uh, particular uh, thing is happening. I think uh, let me jump this. So what what was this? What was the aim of this study? What is the aim of this particular study that I'm currently doing? Obviously, it, it is trying to. to, to we, 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 I'm try, I, I've undertaken this particular study to try and evaluate the realization of the right of access to information during the 2023. Uh, uh, harmonized election in Zimbabwe. But in doing that, I focused more on trying to understand uh, it from the perspective of electoral stakeholders, obviously ZEC uh, being uh, one of the main things, but also uh, the law enforcement agencies, political parties and candidates, the media and regulatory bodies like your POTRAS, like your, Zim your BAS, like your Zimbabwe uh, uh, media commission and also different uh, CSOs that are in the electoral space, but also in the media space in terms of how uh, the country, but also how these different actors also complied with the guidelines of access to information. Then in terms of the findings that, that I think are, are, are worth talking about right now, I think uh, one thing that I just want to, to emphasize is that certainly, whereas uh, in Zimbabwe, the, 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 the Zimbabwe Electoral Aid Commission is considered to be uh, the, 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 the main electoral management body. The ways in which uh, the, 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 the people that actually sit on that, the commissioners actually appointed. Yes, the, the process seems to be very much uh, open. As you can see, for example, in terms of uh, whenever there, there is a vacancy in that particular space, the government, the, 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 the parliament must make sure that they advertise for that and then you know, public interviews are held. But what is very interesting about that particular act or the part law that actually governs the operations of ZEC is that um, these commissioners, once the, the once the once the parliament does its interviews, it it is only obligated to send a list of nine. Let's say, for example, list of nine people to the president. It is the president's prerogative to choose at least six uh, out of that, for example. And in in the last in, in the last uh, previous. Uh, for example, let me just go back. I want to just show you what happened in the in the, pre uh, the last. So yes. your time is almost up. You should be wrapping up. Just give us the major, major, major findings here. All right, so it's fine. So I was saying the appointment of these commissioners, for example, if you look at the uh, appointment that happened in July 2022, just before the elections, if you look at the people that were appointed, for example, people like uh, Abigail Mohadi, for example, he says she's a daughter of the vice president right now. Again, if you see people like Catherine Poff is related to another person who is also within the ZANU-PF, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, Politburo. 
again, if you look at people like Mr. Kudzashal, again, is related again to people, for example, uh, like the current minister of uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs in Zimbabwe. So again, if you all look at that, again, you begin to see that in as much as the, 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 EF, the, the ZEC actually complied with some of these things. Again, the opaque nature in terms of who actually, uh, in terms of their, their salaries, in terms of how they operate, again, you see that we are still struggling. So most of the, the, the things actually then actually in terms of checking the boxes, actually one can actually say there was a lot of partly compliance, part, part compliance in terms of uh, a lot of things. So a lot of things, again, you would see that for example, in terms of the information that is actually on the ZEC website, for example, yes, it's there, but obviously it's written again in English, but most of the people actually use uh, English and in, in, in is their main uh, uh, ways in which they communicate. Again, that also raises another challenge. So in as much as we have the information that is actually being proactively uh, disclosed uh, by this uh, uh, electoral management body, but there are also other challenges that we are also seeing. But over and above that, the other issue that is also very uh, uh, important is that there was also, uh, you know, is, you know, delays. For example, in 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 in, in uh, distributing uh, electoral uh, uh, voting materials. So, for example, in strong was uh, for the opposition. For example, in uh, Arare, in some parts in Blawayo, you also had people actually struggling. Actually, then ended up voting overnight, and uh, that also demonstrates again that the proactive disclosure of information was also something that was not really taken seriously. But even in terms of the way in which actually uh, ZEC also dealt with the complaints around it, again, there was a lot of uh, arrogance in terms of how they went about trying to, to, to explain what actually happens, or what it could have actually caused that kind of uh, delay. So in, in, in a way, while least the uh, compliance in other in, in certain issues uh, related to, for example, the, 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 the post-election uh, day, uh, in terms of making sure that the results came out early. Again, there were issues around the tabulation of the presidential vote. Up to now, people don't know how that was actually done. People were just given the last number. Where the numbers actually came, there was no transparency and accountability in terms of how they actually got that kind of number. Yes, there could have been uh, election results posted via V11s and V32s, but even if you look at the V11s that were also there, some of the V11s obviously is we also learned or also doctored along the way. So again, that also raises a lot of challenges going into the future to say what should uh, you know ZEC, for example, do in to make sure that they proactively deal with some of the issues. Let me just talk about the issue of the media. Yes, journalists were not really affected a lot. Obviously, we had a few complaints compared to the yes. Very briefly, and then and then wrap up. All right, I see that I am. Um, let me just uh, finalize. So let me just conclude so that maybe we can have a conversation around it. Obviously, I think one thing that I've flagged, which is very important, is the opacity of the operations of SEC. That up to now, we don't know how much these people are paid. Uh, you know, uh, you know the, 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 the non-disclosure agreements that also govern the way how they do operations. It's also not very clear. The code of conduct is also not very clear. But also, in, in a way, what has actually happened is that while it's, there is proactive disclosure of information, it has now become almost like a ticking of boxes exercise where you are just doing it. But again, in terms of the language in which it is coached, sometimes it's actually done in English. And therefore, if you look at the context uh, in which uh, Zimbabwe is, some people actually may not be able to decode that kind of information. I've talked about the delays in distributing uh, of it, voting uh, materials. Uh, of course, uh, journalists have said that they were generally uh, able to do their work, but of course there were cases where journalists actually uh, struggled actually to have access to certain spaces because FAS was uh, the forever uh, associate of Zimbabwe were also uh, a menace uh, during this particular election. The abuse of assisted voting also was also another issue. Yes, people that are uh, you know, living with disabilities could actually vote, but again, this has actually been abused uh, for a long time. The opaque nature of state uh, political funding is also another issue. Money, of course, came through uh, the state, but also obviously it was uh, siphoned and sent, uh, given to uh, the opposition, uh, opposition in the name of uh, the MDCT in this case. Again, it is very opaque in terms of how that actually is arrived at. But uh, of course, I've already talked about uh, people living with disabilities. So certainly there's still a lot of in, that still needs to be done in terms of making sure that we don't leave others behind in terms of proactively uh, distributing uh, information during elections. Because of time, let me just try and stop there so that we can have a conversation. But 
uh, the report will be so will be will be will be ready very soon. Uh, over to you, uh, King. Yes, I I think we can tell from you know the just the snippets that we got. I I don't know whether those were just snippets, uh, at Maya, but you you gave us quite a lot to to process. Um, on what we observed on on the Zimbabwean um elections, and definitely, like I I said that you know there was a lot that that was uh, that was going on and uh, quite dramatic indeed. Um, if I see there are questions, we'll get back to the questions. And I want to call upon Maxwell uh, to speak about all these developments that we see uh, taking place or on the continent, um, issues of, uh, you know, electoral integrity being undermined, um, issues of uh, coups that we are seeing. And some people are even saying that, should we even have elections if we are going to have them in the manner in which we do them in some context? Should we consider them? Maybe we should try another method. Is this Is this working for us? And when you look at the issue of technology and elections, is it is it working? Are we ready uh, to use such kind of technologies in the in the context of elections? You would recall what happened in uh, in, in Nigeria at the beginning of the year when when they had the election. So we just want Maxwell to come in and and just give us a few uh, remarks around his thoughts on on what is happening. So uh, Maxwell is is a lawyer. Uh, he's with the Open Society uh, Foundations, and he's been working quite extensively on these uh, instruments that we are talking about today, um, the development of the model law and access to information um, for Africa. He was part of the team that developed that model law, um, the guidelines on access to information and elections in Africa. Um, he was part of that team as well. And now the uh, uh, Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression, uh, and access to information in Africa. He was also part of that team and he has been involved as well in popularizing um, these instruments. We uh, a podcast that, uh, you know, we recorded with Maxwell where he kind of brings in together all these issues on access to information, including in the context of elections on the, on the continent. I will share the link and you can listen to him as he speaks about the work that he has been doing across the continent on the work of access to information and also just in the development of national um, legislation on, on access to information has been involved uh, in that and also media freedom or freedom of expression broadly. So Maxwell, um, over to you. Uh, please, um, Lengiwe, confirm that you guys can hear me? Yes, please. Okay, all right. Okay, uh, I'm trying to get on my video, but I'm sure if yes, I'm I just, um, uh, admire to, to stop fine. Oh, fine. Yeah, Thank I can you. I can speak because realizing that we are also okay. friends for time. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, you know. So please proceed. Lengiwe, can you still hear me? Yes, Maxwell, please proceed. We can hear you uh, clearly. Okay, all right. Um, so good afternoon from Abuja um, to colleagues. It's, um, it's like homecoming for me because I see a lot of uh, senior colleagues, friends. Um, it's great to be, I, I'm not, not sure whether she's still on, but it's great to be here with... Uh, a lady I call mom, Advocate Pansi Lakula, with uh, my senior elder, my distinguished elder brother, Advocate, um, advocate uh, Commissioner Lawrence Mute, um, Commissioner Topsy Sono, um, Oga Lloyd, uh, Jagan, and many, many more other colleagues who are here. It, this is really like homecoming, and I'm grateful to the center for giving me this opportunity of being with this august body. I think mine is uh, easiest, which is just reflecting on uh, what has been shared through the reports and then the questions and the comments, and then making a few suggestions. Um, I would want to just start out by saying, 
li listening to the reports and having been part of some of them, particularly the the first one, which is not part of this conversation, which is South Africa, and then the one that was authored by Jagan uh, with the help of colleagues in the Gambia, um, and reflecting back on her on the journey thus far in the context of promoting uh, freedom of expression and access to information on the continent, I dare say it just proves the, the unique value and the importance of the work that has been done in terms of not just creating these soft law instruments, whether it's the model law, whether it's the guidelines, whether it's expanding the declaration of principles, but also applying them. And for this, I really, really will want to say a big thank you to all the mandate holders, you know, who have overseen this work from Commissioner um, Pansit Lakula um, through to Commissioner Mute, um, through to Commissioner Jamesina King, who is not here, and then to the current mandate holder. I think the wisdom, the vision, and the energy that has gone into the into the process of developing these instruments could not have come at a much more, more opportune time. And when you see um, what we've what we've heard from the researchers in terms of the four country reports today, you then see how strategic the engagement has been and how um, critical the decision to look at ATI in the context of elections uh, has also been because. When this was being, when we we're thinking through, um, we talk about ATI being a standalone right as well as a leverage right because it enables the realization of several other rights. There were different issues that could have been that were being considered at the time, you know, particularly after having developed the Shwane principles, which was ATI and national security, uh, global principles. The question then became, what else do we want to look at? You know, and there were several options, but the choice of elections at the time was quite unique because we we're like looking at the Africa continent. Elections are a big issue, and the contestation of our elections are also critical. And there are challenges in the context of the integrity, the credibility, the the of free and fair and the free and fair nature of elections on the continent. How could we begin to stem that through deploying the right of access to information in that context? And that's how the guidelines were designed. So now listening to the application through these reports, you know, just makes one uh, super glad that these instruments exist, but also talks about the volume of work that also still needs to be done you know, and um, the reality of what is now becoming the sad context on the continent. So I will try not to rehash um, what has come through from uh, from the reports, but just to deal with a few pointers uh, while at the same time making recommendations or suggestions on the way forward. And in no particular order of importance, but I will run through it in the hope that my role here is to further the conversation and maybe en engender greater debate and also see what else can be done and how can we begin to address, I mean, some of these challenges. Um, the first thing is, as, as comes through from the reports and also what's been experienced um, in, in practical terms on the continent, including in the part of the continent where, where I operate from, which is West Africa, which is now being seen increasingly as the hotbed or the, uh, of military coups and democratic reversals of the continent. Is also how did how how I mean how did we get here? Um, are there issues that and it's also clear when you look at all of the write-ups, um, all of the public analysis, and even the posturing of uh, uh, the military rulers who have actually taken over the reins of power in some of the countries in our sub-region and basically sacked uh, what would be. Um, described in, in, in some form as democratically elected leaders. Um, sadly, it's also been reported that some of those elected leaders came in through the process of flawed elections. So, which is leading, leading to a loss of faith, you know, in the electoral protest process and the political system, you know, and that was one of the objectives behind developing the guidelines because the sense was, if you enable proactive disclosure of information, 
you enable greater participation of the citizenry, you know, uh, in the electoral process, you enable transparency and accountability, you also enable electoral integrity, and then you also enable a process where citizens are able, because they, they follow the process, they've been able to participate in the process, they believe the process has been fair, fair and credible, then they are able to defend the outcome, you know, and that would have created a scenario where the democratic rollback that we are seeing now would have been impossible, you know. So the objective behind the guidelines were great and came ahead of its time, but sadly we are where we are now. So the question is, how do we then further deepen this process in terms of uh, using the guidelines to further engage, but beyond engaging, to begin to upturn what is um, seen now as the process of flawed election, which is basically eroding confidence in electoral processes, um, creating a rollback in democratic principles, so much so that um, citizens of some of these countries actually welcome, you know, uh, the military leader, the military, new military rulers in the corridors of power and are willing to basically sacrifice uh, democracy, again, because it's, it's essentially been defined as flawed because of the way it's been practiced in many of these countries without wanting to basically make any pronouncement in terms of uh, a determination, but just looking, feeling the pulse and seeing what we are reading, you know, from the reaction of the populace in, in many of these countries, of course, the most recent being, or rather the one closest to us here, you know, being Niger, but the most recent being Gabon, you know, and, and what has transpired, you know. So uh, it's, 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 it's um, one, one way of saying it, of looking at it in addition to the challenges, like I've said, is how do we also use this process and this engagement to stem the tide of military coups, you know, and then reset uh, the elections processes in many of our countries and also uh, uh, make move towards strengthening uh, democracy. One of the recommendations I would like to make so that it's not just the fact that we do this analysis, we do these reports, is how do we take them forward? And one of the suggestions is, I think I've shared this with Lady Wei and a few other colleagues, but given the fact that this is the first official uh, program of having um, four country reports being taken together, I would want to suggest quite strongly um, a process that um, needs to be led by colleagues here and colleagues outside here. And I'm glad that the special rapporteur is hopefully still here. And then our predecessors are also here. It's also to get a sense that maybe it's also time, uh, given where Africa is now in the context of elections, you know, and how that is closely anchored under Article 13 of the African Charter dealing with the right to participate, to look at a scenario where the African Commission on Human and People's Rights is able to have also have a focused attention on elections. I know that previously, something that we've been told when uh, the consideration of how the attention of the commission can be expanded through creation of ad additional mandates to look at emerging issues on the continent. You know, um, there's been pushed back because the mandate holders, I mean, given the framework of how the commission is established, uh, creating new mandates, it's, it's almost uh, impossible. And um, the only possibility in terms of the short term will be looking at expanding the, the terms of reference or the uh, responsibilities of existing mandate holders. And I'm asking the question, I'm making the proposition here, that given the close relationship between Article 9 and Article 13, you know, that's the right of access to information and the right of freedom of expression and how that enables the right to participation, which was also the framing that enabled the development of uh, these guidelines on ATL elections. Is it not also time that the mandate of the special rapporteur on ATL elections be expanded to also include the right to participation? What that enables us to do is it brings the whole issue of the right to participation in the context of elections and democracy under the focused consideration of the special rapporteur and also enables greater engagement. And in addition to that, it then creates an organized framework in which the outcome of these research reports and the recommendations are also looked at from the perspective of implementation in a systematized process under the remit of the special rapporteur at the African Commission. 
um, I would really want to urge that given where things are, um, elections and issues around democracy cannot be basically um, looked at by the commission as just um, on an ad hoc basis, you know, but needs to, be, needs to be mainstreamed in the context of the work of the commission and in the context of advancing the right to participation. So hopefully, I hope it's not too late, but maybe this is something that needs to be looked at quite closely. And I'm glad that the commission session, some the seventh ordinary session is coming up, it's scheduled to come up in, in Arusha, uh, Tanzania, beginning on, a, on the 20th of October, ending on the 9th of uh, November. I would, I, I would really be pushing that this be one of the key things that the center and other stakeholders involved in this project needs to push at the level of the commission to revisit the mandate of uh, the special rapporteur and extend it beyond just Article 9 to also include Article 13 and let that then be the rallying point for how we engage on this issue of the right to participation, how we engage through that on the issue of the elections, and how we engage through that on issues of democratic regression, and how we through that then begin to address a lot of the recommendations here in the hope that it enables us stem the tides of democratic re re regression and the resurgence of military coup and military dictatorship on the continent, which from my own experience, that is speaking from my experience of having grown up in Nigeria, um, uh, there's, an, uh, there's an inverse unhealthy relationship between promotion and protection of human rights and military dictatorship. And so we need, there's a, there's a sense of urgency and emergency on engaging on these issues in ways that ensures that we are able to address the challenge of flawed elections, address the impact of, uh, of, of uh, democratic regression, and through that strengthen democracy and uh, free, fair and transparent elections, so much so that the people then uh, feel committed as being um, um, first movers in the context of democracy, so much so that they will be willing to defend democracy and then stem the tide of military dictatorships on the continent. You know, so having said that, now coming more, more broadly, which, which is uh, my one of my main key takeaways, and I think it's a project that needs to happen post haste, is then to look a bit more closely um, and a lot of... Um, the re reports have spoken around the issue of um, technology deployment in elections, you know, and what has been the experience thus far. And Lengiwe repeatedly talked about our experience in Nigeria uh, in the context of the deployment of technology, whether it's the biomotor, bimodal voter accreditation system, BVAS, or IREV in the context of transmitting elections. For those who monitor, who followed our recent elections in the first quarter of this year, and then uh, the outcome of the presidential elections tribunal, um, which is now being pivoted to the Supreme Court. And by the way, incidentally, yesterday, we also heard that uh, a section of the Supreme Court of Nigeria got uh, caught up in flames and um, news reports, which need to be confirmed, seem to suggest that the offices of three justices of the Supreme Court were burnt, you know, uh, and the question is, is that, is there any connection between that and then the filing of the appeal from the presidential election tribunal to the Supreme Court, which is supposed to be considered within the next 60 days and then make a determination on um, um, the mandate of our current administration under the new president, you know. So um, technology increasingly is it's not just in the aftermath of, uh, of uh, COVID-19, technology, we've pivoted into the online world and technology is busy, is pretty much taking, is pretty much playing a very active part in our lives and that includes in, in the vexed situation of elections. But the jury is still out in terms of the experience. And um, it's sad that despite the promise of technology, which is supposed to enhance transparency and credibility of our electoral processes in ways that begin to address um, issues around stolen elections, uh, flawed electoral processes, and enhance the credibility of our elections, that that has not been the experience from a practical standpoint. And, and to all intents and purposes, We've also found that uh, in varying degrees, the electoral management bodies have also been complicit 
in the way uh, they they failed to utilize technological technology and technological apps and development to enhance the credibility uh, and the integrity of our elections. And so the question that one needs to ask is then it's is is not about the technology itself; it's about those who superintend the deployment of the technology and how they intend their deployment towards a particular end you know particularly where they are they are weighed in on one side of the or the other depending on where their political interests are even though they are supposed to be apolitical or they publicly claim that they are apolitical but in terms of their actions and the practice you know that is being contested so and uh, um, again, um, it's it's useful as as Lengiwe has said that the analysis is not being done just through um, the guidelines, but it's also looking at part four of the declaration, which speaks to the right of access to information and freedom of expression on the internet, and um, stretches through the entire gamut of technology um, usage and how it affects our lives, and then all of the different principles um, in the context of what applies offline also applies online. And again, this would then be um, one area where in the future, if the guidelines were also to be revisited, how do we strengthen that component? Because it's also true to also assert that when the guidelines were being developed, the issue around um, deployment of technology or the level of technology in our electoral processes was not as ubiquitous as it is now, you know. So how do we then ensure that? And then what should, shouldn't there be some level of accountability, you know, on the part of any stakeholder, including the EMBs, who undermine the electoral processes um, through deploying technology in ways that do not enhance transparency and accountability of the electoral process, but in ways in which enhances the process of the conduct of flawed elections. You know, and it's not just about the experience in Nigeria of uh, uh, um, the challenges with BMAS or, or how despite um, the EMB's um, um, public statement towards ensuring that um, a resource are transmitted via IREV, you know, which was also reflected in his guidelines, but which when push came to show did not happen. It's also going beyond that to also look at what's been the experience in many parts of the continent, including um, what my brother, um, Professor Ad Admire had just said uh, around issues of um, um, internet shutdown, bandwidth throttling, you know, and how that also compromises the process of uh, election credibility. And there's a lot to also uh, learn and benefit from what Commissioner Muti said was the experience in Kenya where um, the, the internet um, and bandwidth were not tampered with, you know, and the internet functioned uh, effectively despite the tensions around the elections. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And that needs to be applauded. And the question then becomes, how do we ensure that that experience, you know, is not just Kenya specific, you know, but also begins to be adopted beyond just the context of Kenya, you know, to many other parts of the continent. Because when you look at our reality, you know, given how integral the internet is to our lives, those who want to scuttle elections or also take the reins of power or even perpetuate grave uh, human rights violations, one of the things they go, uh, one of the things they go for very quickly is shutting down the internet or ensure that you cripple bandwidth through bandwidth shortly, just to ensure that information doesn't go out, you know, and um, also that they are able to perpetrate whatever they want to perpetrate within that period of time. So how do we then do that? And with a recommendation at looking at accountability where we can ascertain those who are responsible for this, you know, and there should be some sanctions, you know, for making that happen. Now, what kinds of sanctions that would be is something we can think about collectively. But within that same context of technology and its impact on electoral processes writ large is also the role of um, technology companies and in this context i would also expand it to look at the mobile telecom operators you know who are also now 
um, much more than mobile telecom operators, but are also mobile financial service providers. And the guidelines don't speak to the tel telco companies uh, in its current context. So is that something that we need to look at and going forward in the context of future uh, research reports on the application of both the guidelines and uh, the declaration of principles, shouldn't we also now be looking at what the role of the technology companies are doing and shouldn't the technology companies also not have a proactive disclosure obligation in the context of not just elections but also even in the context of grave human rights violations and maybe this is also where issues around business and human rights also need to be looked at a bit more closely you know and how do we do those going forward but we need an expanded mandate of the special rapporteur also looking at article 13 it's possible to then begin to have a focused attention on this and create a new context and and even begin to look at beyond just looking at business and human rights is the time not now to look at technology and human rights you know particularly in the specific context of africa you know um where um it's 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 uh, and it's 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 a whole new learning for us you know but how can we avoid some of the pitfalls and why shouldn't we hold the companies to the same level of obligation and responsibility that they have in the global north as they should also have in the global south why is it that here they get away with a lot of things but in the global north they are unable to why are our standards not the same you know so we've got to look at that a bit more broadly I know that with uh, I'm seeing Lengue now on, so I'm sure she's just about telling me that uh, my time is up, you know. So I hope uh, there's a lot more I also wanted to share, you know, but time is never our friends. But please take it that some of the ideas I've just said within the limited time I've had is just to begin a conversation. And you may say, oh, maybe this is crazy. Maybe this is too, it's too uh, ambitious, but... I think given where we are, you know, we need to take our destiny into our hands and we need to be ambitious because if there's one thing that, at least for me at a personal level, that COVID has taught us is if we don't address our problems ourselves, when the chips are down, nobody will come to our aid because um, or even in the context of the developed world, when the chip push comes to show, the first thing they do is look at addressing the context of their nationals. And it's only when that is satisfied that they can then look globally. And then the question, and that then uh, implicates this whole question of global best practices. You know, who determines that? You know, when it's convenient for them, they they change the rules. When it's not convenient for, when it's, when it's also convenient for them, they tell us that what we are doing is not good enough. So until we begin to, basically interrogate these issues and ensure that the peculiarities of Africa and African challenges are addressed and in ways that that is that we are committed to ensuring that the fundamentals of human of human and people's rights are not only promoted and protected within the framework of the African Charter and under the leadership of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, I don't think we would be able to make the kind of process progress that we desire. So these are just a few nuggets and I'm hoping that the debate will continue beyond this platform. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, uh, Maxwell. The you know time is is never enough. You know there's just, just so much to reflect on, and you have given us so much also to think about. Um, as as you were you know reflecting on uh, the issue of uh, you know the the technology component as well, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis what we already have in the guidelines, and some of these issues were not as quite extensive as as they were during the time of of the drafting. So in light of, of that, so some of these developments that are happening, um, uh, there's a question here uh, around the possibility of uh, updating these key instruments, referring to the guidelines, uh, the, the model law, um, the declaration, and, and, and you know, the, the instruments that the African Commission has developed. And uh, I, I don't know your thoughts uh, around, around that. My, my instinctive reaction... Okay. So before you... You respond. If uh, colleagues have questions to Maxwell, please use the raise hand function. I uh, will just give you a few seconds to ask your questions. Please, Maxwell, proceed. Thank you. My my colleague, my uh, response to that is as a takeoff point. I think there is a lot already. You know, provided we are not taking the instruments uh, separately. 
if we take the instruments as a collective, the model law, the guidelines, and the declaration of principles, there is a lot there that can be used to address the challenges we currently have. Because the gap in terms of uh, technology and human rights is filled by part four of the Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, dealing with ATA and FOE on the internet. You know, the question that that raises, which is the challenge I'm throwing back to the colleagues who are flagging that, is we have we done enough to unpack the provisions of part four of the declaration in the context of technology and human rights. And I think that's a challenge that we need to also take on. Because as with many of these instruments, it's difficult to write everything into the language of the instrument, you know, but the instrument sets out the broad strokes and sets out the framework and the guidelines and is then left to the rest of us who are human rights advocates to then unpack what it means in its application. And then also, it also requires the leadership of the African Commission to begin to break that down in different specific contexts. So I would advocate that um, while not saying there would not be time when we would have to probably look at revisiting and updating, but have we used what we have effectively? I mean, I dare say, and I stand to be corrected, that why I'm so excited about this process that the center and the African Commission are championing is, let me ask the question, how many instruments, soft law instruments that the commission has ad ad adopted have actually been applied in practice, you know, the way this is being done now? because it's in the practical application that you then begin to see the gaps and the pitfalls, but you then begin to hold the feet of the states to the fire in terms of their what should be their commitment, you know, because it's not enough for them to come to sessions of the commission and basically reel out platitudes, you know, but what is happening through this process is you are getting evidentiary basis to challenge the platitudes that the state come to these ordinary sessions of the commission to say in from a public relations perspective, which is not borne out by the reality on the ground. So I think we need to engage with these processes more and we need to apply these instruments more. And then what then happens is if by the time we need to do a revis a, an updating of the instrument, there will be sufficient experience gathered through these research reports and the analysis of the deep experiences on the ground that would also identify where the gaps are and then what needs to be looked at. Just like, uh, I mean, I've shared here, which you also validated Lengiwe, that when the guidelines were being developed, I mean, issues around technology and its impact on elections was not where it is now. So you then find that the guidelines don't speak to the issue of, techn of technology companies you know, of GSM companies and their role in the context of elections, which you and I now know are serious because in the context of Uganda, for example, the Uganda Communications Authority sent letters to the leading GSM companies to basically shut down the internet over the period of the elections. And the response, I'm sure, I'm, I know that there are cases in court challenging that, and the response of the companies were that they had to comply with that based on the terms of their licenses. But then the flip side of that is, what about their, their CSR, their uh, obligations, consumer ob ob obligations to their consumers, who also provide the resources for the company? Is it that it's a case of an animal farm where all animals are equal, but some are more equal than the others because the government gives them the licenses, but the licenses have no value if the subscribers don't take up the services. So those, those are things that we need to look at, but then it will be based on what the lived reality on the ground is. But this is also why I am really pushing, you know, for an expansion of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur, because if there is no focused framework for looking at these issues from a right to participation perspective, which is also closely integrated to access to information and freedom of expression, then what would happen is these things would be discussed on an ad hoc basis. You know, and there will be not that focused lens to be able to systematically address the issue, which is only possible when you have a mandate looking at it from a broad perspective. Thank you. Wow. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Maxwell. So I, I see on the on the call, we also have um, um, a, a colleague, um, of uh, a friend of the center chairman whose work is on business and human rights. And I, I hope he's listening that, uh, you know, this is an, an area that we need to also uh, reflect on the issue of business and, and human rights and how, you know, it dovetails into the spectrum of um, of elections and, you know, all, all but, these are... are but Lengiwe, I'm also saying in the context of Africa, the time is also ripe to talk about technology and human rights. 
it's not it's, just business and human it's, rights. It's, and, it's yes. the center we have been running a, a, a campaign on, on tech, tech for rights. Yes. Um, so we are already on, on, on that and we are, you know, requesting also other stakeholders to, to do the same, to jump onto the... And, 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 and there's a huge minefield there because now we're talking about uh, generative AI you know, uh, artificial intelligence, chat GPT, what do all those mean? And all these are also going to have an impact on elections going forward, you know, quite. So you see that there's a whole lot out there and Africa is always like the last frontier, you know, when these things are taught about, which is why I am now saying that I think it's high time that we we take our destiny into our hands because there's a, no, there's a lot of expertise and experience on the continent that can drive these discourses. Uh -huh. Okay, um, Jagan, your, your hand was up. Please um, uh, take the floor. Oh, wow. Um, I, I, in the interest of time then, so th just two things. Um, one is uh, I, I put my recommendation as how we should move forward with uh, with uh, these reports um, in the chat. So I don't I don't need to uh, rehash it. Um, I think um, Maxwell, thank you very much um, for talking about some of these issues um, and also very thought provoking. I hope that we'll be able to accommodate some of these recommendations and basically update um, the tool itself um, as we move forward. Um, but I wanted to maybe in the interest of time, but just for you to consider um, issues around intellectual property rights, right? And data, um, data gathering um, in terms of registration. Um, particularly when we see our um, independent electoral commissions or the elections regulator um, outsourcing um, a lot of this um, kind of an exercise and service provision um, through procurement um, that is not very clear at times and also contracting. Um, so are you able to perhaps maybe um, give us a couple of suggestions as to how we'd be able to, number one, um, protect our intellectual property rights um, as owners of that information and the data um, that's being outsourced in terms of procurement and contracting. And then secondly, uh, what pressures could we put um, to be brought to bear um, for this to be proactively disclosed, not only at the level of the elections regulator, but also most importantly, at the government level, because most governments have been complicit in putting pressure on the elections regulator as to who they give these contracts to. Right. And certain individuals also have been fingered around that. And then the final point I wanted to make is um, in terms of mainstreaming um, some of these studies, Max, um, aside from just leaving it to the African Commission, my thoughts are and, and it'll be good to hear what you think about this. My thoughts are just basically to try and get the buy in now um, of the political affairs, peace and security under the um, elections um, assistance unit to make it part of you know, the tools that they're going to utilize in assessing elections integrity on the African continent, precisely because this report, um, and a lot of people might have missed it. For me, what is important about these reports and this exercise is that it basically encompasses four of the main governance elements um, that most countries have signed on to. The AUCPCC, which is the Anti-Corruption Convention, the AGDEG, which is the Elections and Democracy Charter, the African um, um, Charter on Human Rights, and also the primary governance um, mechanism, which is the African peer review mechanism. And this particular tool, if you look at it, however, which way you dissect it, addresses all these things at the same time. So I think it's, so, it's such a good thing, but the question is how do we now get the AU as a commission to ensure that this percolates to the RECs and also to the national level? Thank you. Um, Maxwell, as as you respond to Jagan's question, uh, please. Uh, we are running. We we have gone far far beyond <laughs> time. I recognize that other colleagues have raised questions on Zimbabwe. I I did not ignore the questions, but uh, the speaker admire. I I think there is load shedding where he is. So he's he's um you know he's jumped off the call. So he is not in a position to, to respond, but I do take note of the concerns that have been raised around the issue of, of Zimbabwe. Um, I wish he was here to directly respond to that, but the report is being put together and some of these uh, elements are going to make their way into, into the report. So Maxwell, as you wrap up, you can just give us a few reflections on, on what Jagan has raised. Um, and, and also I think there's a concern uh, or, or comment um, 
uh, a colleague is saying that uh, when was Africa going to implement all, all these all these things that we have and uh, um, when did the human rights law, when will it be executed in Africa by the African Union because there is abuse of, of power by, by African um, leaders. So those are some of, of the thoughts. And um, I don't know, Nkweti, if uh, it's a very brief remark, very brief in, in under a minute. Uh -huh. Ngwezi, Ron, Roland? Yes, please. Okay, thanks very much. I was just unable to meet, unmute myself. So, uh, to Mr. Maxwell Katsiri, still, I just want to uh, propose, for example, that uh, considering the fast, which uh, ICT, that's uh, information communication technologies, are, 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 are going around or moving. I think we rather think of catching up. Uh, maybe some of uh, some of the tools he's talking of are already useless or isolated. Uh, we might not be uh, able to use them again. Then, secondly, I wanted to propose that CSOs, civil society organizations, should be able to hold service providers responsible of, of, for abusing their rights to connection. I'm not saying to communication, but to connection in such a way they can be empowered. That the public can be empowered in such a way that if uh, during elections, uh, connection is suspended, for example, they may say, okay, for two weeks or more, they may give a certain length of time when uh, the consumption of the products of that particular service provider. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yes, Maxwell, very briefly. I know the issues a lot that have been raised, and I know you have a lot to say, uh, but please uh, just uh, wrap up with the uh, reflecting on, on these issues that have been raised, uh, and then we'll call upon Lloyd to uh, give the closing remarks. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I I agree with my brother uh, Unkweti, so I really have nothing useful to add there um, on that score. With Jegan, um, I I mean, Jegan, you are you had a lot of engagement with the AU, so the question is for you to be able to tell us what path to follow. But I do agree that uh, this needs to be elevated to the level of of uh, the African Union Commission, and also needs to be mainstreamed you know, into the processes. And, and to the extent that we, you should, should, this, should this not be part of the background documents or the key documents that each time a monitoring mission is being constituted for an election on the continent, should this not be part of the instruments and the documents that the team will be required, not just to acquit themselves, but also to apply. You know, so I think it's for you to, I'm basically throwing the back at you to say your work is cut out for you in that regard. And it's for you to just tell us what you need us to do and the rest of us would follow. But it's also important for the African Commission itself. And this is where the thing about the mandate of the special rapporteur becomes crucial because we need a point of engagement at the level of the commission on these issues with the Africa Union Commission. And this is where that partnership needs to be enhanced. And it's it's easier to enhance it where that mandate and uh, is also um, expanded. But I would even argue that we, maybe we don't even need to talk about an expansion. Maybe is the question is what is the appetite of the mandate holder to actually do this? Because within the remit of the current terms of reference, this this can be done, you know. So it's not. And when you look at even um, the framing and the the preamble to all the instruments, you already see an a, an acceptance and an admission of the close relationship between Article 9 and Article 13. So it's already there and we just need to move on with it. So I, I think in addition to Jagan, you telling us how to engage with the AU, it's also the commission and the special rapporteur being willing to also provide leadership for that process. The point you raised about data and all of that is spot on. It, and, and, I would, and, and for me, this is one of the revelations actually, because it was interesting listening to Commissioner Mute's presentation where he talked about um, 
issues around transparency in the context of data, where people only got to find out that their names had been put on the political party role of certain political parties without their, their request, their willingness, or their permission, which speaks to this the issue you just flagged. You know, and I think it's actually important. And at some point ago, some colleagues were looking at a, a possible litigation on the question of who owns the data. You know, it's not just the data of the the, the data that has been assessed by the EMBs. It's also the data that is being is being used by the big platforms. You know, which belongs to you and I, but it's being deployed without any recourse to the rest of us. And within the broader remit of the conversation on data protection, there are issues to be looked at there. And that's why I see, you see, I said the standards in the global north and the standards in the global south are different because within the context of GDPR in the global north, you find that these big platform providers can't do a lot of the things that they do in sub-Saharan Africa. And the question is why? So we need to basically take, or take I mean, engage with these issues and basically not just at the level of the EMBs, because it's also challenging in today's world that the EMBs outsource uh, data to service providers without getting the clearance or authorization of, of, of the data owners, if I'm allowed to use that expression, which is you and I, you know? So again, these are all of the issues that we need to engage engage with. And certainly, uh, as you can understand from my sentiments, the data belongs to you and I because it's our data and we have to provide leadership and have a sense of control, you know, in terms of how that data is being deployed, you know, and in the context of new technological developments, you find out that uh, there's a huge problem that also needs to be addressed, you know, particularly particularly in the context of uh, where we find ourselves. And the other thing we need to look at, and this is where, again, um, I'm not taking our permission, but this is where I would think that um, uh, individuals like Advocate Pansi Lakula, given her unique role now, also need to provide leadership for us because as the information regulator and also oversighting access to information, she has a broader perspective on these issues and is able to provide leadership for us in terms of this whole issue of data and data ownership and whether some of the um, um, activities being undertaken by the EMBs, but in the peculiar context that you've outlined um, um, right now, um, Jagan, whether they actually should fly in the face of the law, you know, particularly in the context of South, South Africa, where you have the Papia, you know, in place vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, Paya. Um, Paya, Paya as well. So it, it, it's, it, the, it, the issues are well known, but the question is, what do we do? And I end with what I said, that we do have enough knowledge. We do have enough individuals with expertise. We do have a lot of experience and standing on the continent to begin to provide leadership on this issue that even the global north would have to take a cue from us. So that will be my submission, but I think we all have a lot our work cut out for us. The question is, what do we want to do and are we willing to apply our minds and energies to it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxwell. So um, at some point I asked Maxwell to send me, um, share with me his brief bio and the brief bio was about two pages. So <laughs> you can understand, uh, you know, uh, that when you ask him to speak for, for a minute, he, he, will, he, will make it, uh, he will make it fine. But that's also a, an indication that uh, Maxwell, you have been around. Um, and doing the work on the continent um, uh, around access to information, and freedom of expression. Now there is this whole; uh, it has expanded. You know the 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 work in uh, because of you know the, the embracing and deployment of uh, technology on the on the continent. And this gives us a lot to think about. And uh, I really, I'm, I'm most grateful for for the insights and also Jagan um, uh, the reflections also as well on how we can make use of uh, of these reports because it's not about just decorating our websites with very good reports the the actual impact is in how we are able to make 
actual use of them? What impact can we make with these reports that we are, are producing? So that is where the, the work lies in being able to use these as, as tools for change on the continent. Um, now I want to uh, call upon Lloyd, uh, Assistant Director of the Center for Human Rights to um, give us his closing um, remarks and also just to thank everybody. Um, Lloyd, over to you. Uh, thanks, thank you. I don't have much to say and I'm not going to take time uh, because I think uh, a lot has been said. Um, just to thank everyone uh, from Commissioner uh, Topsy Sono to Maxwell, who has just uh, given us an overview and also his suggestions to all the four researchers. And I think, uh, thank you so much for the suggestions in terms of the way forward. Uh, as Leng was said, the reports are going to be on our website, but also we'll proactively disseminate the reports as well with uh, key stakeholders, including within the African human rights system itself, as well as at the sub-regional level and at the domestic levels of each of our nations. So this is what we promise everyone, uh, but I think uh, three key issues um, that really were flagged out, which we need to be focusing on, I think going forward and perhaps as further you know, reflections, the issue of uh, the use or abuse of state resources to either facilitate or restrict public participation, the expansion of the mandate of the special rapporteur to go beyond article nine, but uh, to include uh, Article 13 on, on public participation, and also uh, the elephant in the room today, the deployment of uh, technologies and how that is regulated to either facilitate, enhance, or uh, to restrict access and openness and transparency during uh, elections. So thank you so much, everyone. And I also want to thank everybody for the active participation we had over 100 participants uh, in this webinar. I think that has been really great. That shows the importance of the subject and this issue that we're discussing today. Thank you so much. Over to the moderator, Tlengiwe and uh, Sarah. The two of you have your work cut out for you, not just on the sidelines of the African Commission session, but also with the other human rights bodies, as well as at the national levels. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lloyd. As we close, I also just want to give, uh, you know, um, I also want to appreciate the African Commission for the willingness to um, come on board and assess, you know, the compliance of state with the guidelines that uh, they developed. And um, just to also indicate that I've shared the link, uh, there's a podcast which was recorded by the Center for Human Rights uh, with Maxwell Kadiri, where he's unpacking some of these issues that he was talking about. So you can listen to him on the podcast. There's a link there. We'll also be releasing another one with Advocate Pansi Tlakula that we have recorded, where she's also reflecting on her previous role as the special rapporteur, but also the current role that she's in as the information uh, regulator. And the Kenyan report has also been summarized into a podcast as well um, with uh, and Commissioner Lawrence Mute will also be publishing that as well for you to, to uh, listen at your own time. I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. I know there are, you know, you had other things to attend to, but you chose to be with us today. Uh, thank you to the panelists. Uh, I just want to give my co-moderator a few seconds to say goodbye as we close. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Leng Yue. Um, thank you to everyone who made it to the call today. We appreciate the insights, the input, your contribution, your very hard-hitting questions. Uh, as Hlingu has said that uh, all the reports will be available on our website, both the Article 19 website and the Center's website, as well as our social media pages. Uh, on behalf of Article 19 East and West Africa, apologies from our Senegal office who are not able to attend, uh, but they are with us uh, as well. Uh, they managed to join in a bit late uh, on the chat, but uh, their regards and uh, their thanks as well for joining in and supporting us. Uh, on behalf of all of us, Thank you so much. We wish you a great day. And uh, hopefully we will be able to engage with you and we'll continue engaging with the outcome of these reports. Asanteni. Asanteni Sana. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody have a lovely day. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you um, for the webinar. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.
Center for Human Rights Communications, thank you so much. Much appreciated your behind the scenes work. Uh, we really appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. Andile, uh, Simpiwe, Vicky, thank you so much. We'll see. Thank you, thank you so much. I thought we were going to respond, Simpiwe, at least. 